gentlemen. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Monday Night Mayhem, a uh, special show here at Guild Superior where we scour the multiverse of the TTRPG space, looking to bring you new faces, new games, new systems, and all of that fun stuff. I am your humble host for the evening, Miko, otherwise known as the OKest GM uh, on all of the socials. Uh, and I just have a couple of quick things to get through before we kick things off. Uh, uh, we will get to all of the fun stuff tonight, and you get can get to see the other faces that you came here to watch because it certainly was not mine um so yes tonight we are running part three of my own homebrew world of east terra in a game called uh the lost sands there will be one more episode for this uh, uh next monday where we uh, get to do the the final and a climactic conclusion. I'm looking forward to this game as well as that one. Um, so just to kick things off here, um, anybody that has, you know, watched any of our shows here on Guild Superior knows that we've always got awesome things going on. And whether it's, uh, you know, this show on Monday night, Guild, or the... Um, <laughs> Oh my goodness, my brain, I, Heroes of Greyhawk on Tuesday nights, uh, or the Shade Song Saga, you should definitely uh, be tuning in to all of the stuff that we've got going on. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that after, or at the um, at the end of things. Uh, if you want to keep up on all of that stuff, though, you should join our Discord and follow us on the Twitters and stuff. Links are going out in the chat, uh, I hope. Um, and... Uh, Yay, that is actually working. I am glad because I forgot to test that in advance. Um, that's the great way for you guys to get involved in the stuff that we do. Uh, we all, uh, Every single person that you're seeing on the stream tonight um, responded to posts that we had in Discord and social media to get on the screen. So uh, if you want to get involved in the things we do, those are great ways to follow us up. Uh, but if you want to get involved in tonight's action, you can do that with bits. Um, for every uh, 100 bits uh, that you guys uh, uh, throw out there, um, you can pick a player or you can pick me if you think I'm doing a good job or just need some help. Um, and that individual gets uh, an advantage that they can use at any point during uh, tonight's stream. Um, I personally also want to give a quick shout out to uh, Tabletop Audio. Um, they are providing all of the music uh, for tonight's show, um, and they're awesome. If you want to, uh, uh, if you want to bring their awesomeness to your table, you should absolutely follow them up on Patreon uh, if you want. But they also have free stuff as well on TabletopAudio.com. Uh, links are in the chat. Uh, they're amazing, and um, I'm also going to give a, a personal shout out to uh, one of the players tonight, Beth. Uh, they created a map for uh, Aubrath, which is the country that uh, tonight's game is taking place in. The, oh, excuse me. That was that is absolutely amazing. Uh, I'm going to show it off uh, in a little bit. Um, and uh, yeah, thank big big hearts to to Beth. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Why don't we uh, Why don't we jump in on the action and let me introduce you to the rest of the crew here. Hey, everybody, how you doing? Well, hello. Um, nice, right? <laughs> This Hello. this is the the wonderful cast that I have mm -hmm. tonight. Uh, let's uh, let's go around the table and let you guys introduce yourselves. Andrew, you want to kick us off? Yeah, I'm Andrew. I am a human person. Um, you can find my uh, socials in the chat. I'm playing Val tonight. Fun fact about Val is that she likes uh, samosas a lot. It's probably her favorite cocktail. <laughs> she drinks them on Sundays with her grandma. <laughs> good to know good to know what about uh, when she's in jail water probably you mean when <laughs> grandma's in on jail? the menu <laughs> yeah well, is grandma in jail also because then the plan's on <laughs> <laughs> beth why don't you introduce yourself please hi uh i'm beth and i'm super excited to see if we get to meet Val's grandma today. Um, <laughs> uh, you can find me on social media at Beth Masco, um, both Twitter and Instagram. Um, yeah, and I'm uh, I'm playing Ada, who um, had some experiences last time, uh, if if you recall. So hopefully we'll uh, dig into that a little bit. I, th I think we might. I think we might. Uh, hey. Who are you? What do you do? Where can we find you? 
<laughs> uh, I don't know. I'm lost. Um, sorry. My how'd name is. <laughs> and how did your name and picture end up in the overlay? I don't remember doing that. No, I totally did that. I would have K in every single game I could possibly have, just so you guys know. <laughs> I'd be so tired. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so my name is K or uh, K in Cosmos. You can find me on pretty much any social there at that point. At this point, uh, I do all sorts of art from physical to digital. I play games, uh, you know, whatever, all sorts of stuff. Uh, today, I am playing Reeves Erickson, the displaced veteran. Uh, he is hired to bodyguard this group, um, but to what ends? Uh, he definitely managed to avoid answering uh, when pressed earlier in the um, little uh, library. So, I don't know. Maybe he can avoid it again, hopefully. Fingers crossed. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, Will. You got some awesome Hello. stuff going on. I tuned into into it last night. You should definitely tell people about that. We have a few things going on. Hi, my name is Will. Um, you can find me on all of the social media at a Will M Scream. Um, you can more often find me with Live from the Apocalypse, the not for profit TTRPG studio where we make actual play content like streams and podcasts to raise money for nonprofits and good organizations. We're currently raising money for the First Nations Development Institute. And we do a lot of things. So if you're not following Live from the Apocalypse on Twitch and Twitter, you can go ahead and do that. You can find all of our podcasts on your platform of choice at Live from the Apocalypse, including the Masks Podcast Academy H that Miko is referencing, which we recorded last night. And that is me. I play Walsh, uh, the pilot with a bit of a scoundrel streak. Awesome. Um... Good stuff, good stuff. Uh, why don't I actually take a second here and figure out, yep, uh, I'm going to do a little bit of a catch up so that we can kind of feel out where everybody is at uh, and let the audience know all of the good stuff. So we'll get back to your lovely faces here in just one moment. So let us discuss the Lost Sands. This intrepid group of adventurers has come together uh, to uh, make their way across the desert deserts of Aubrath. Uh, they are a disparate group, having hardly known each other previously. M many of them never, never even knew the other existed. And yet, uh, in the service of the um, spires of rulership uh, here in Aubrath, they have found themselves in this situation in which they are sent to explore a ruins that has been revealed by, um, by a, a sandstorm that uh, shook much of the eastern portions of the country. Um, dispatched post-haste aboard their sand skimmer, uh, a um, basically uh, boat-style vessel uh, with uh, many, many sails um, that uh, almost floats and rides across the very desert themselves, uh, dubbed the Dune Raker. They have used this vessel to traverse the vast distances from the western side of the country all the way over to the east. Um, on the way was not without its peril, where they encountered um, a certain um, group of uh, uh, beetle-like scarabs that were a little bit uh, larger than some might expect, uh, and uh, having successfully managed to prevent their deaths uh, in such an encounter, they did unfortunately not uh, prevent some serious damage to the Dune Raker. But thankfully, that evening, after um, some perhaps insight from uh, a higher being, uh, they encountered a small desert-dwelling creature um, looking a little bit mushroomy, uh, but obviously carrying uh, a great deal of power within them. Um, they uh, aided everyone uh, and siphoned a little bit of energy from uh, Ada, one of uh, uh, Beth's character, to repair and recharge their Dune Raker. Uh, after that experience, they made their way once again, uh, eventually um, encountering the ruins after being chased also by a sandstorm that uh, left them all uh, in a virtual little tiny pocket dimension library that Ada possesses um, to wait out the storm, get to know each other a little bit, but eventually 
return to the deserts uh, and discover the ruins awaited them. Delving deep down uh, into the subterranean levels of the deserts of Aubrath, the ruins uh, revealed themselves, but not before they were accosted once again uh, by another desert creature, this time um, a sand drake that uh, they managed to dispatch. It was a couple of sand drakes, actually, that they managed to dispatch quite well, in fact, um, suffering a, a, a few scrapes and bruises, and a little bit of dehydration, perhaps. But uh, they got through it nonetheless before eventually finding their way to the front entrance of the this buried ruins of what they believe to be perhaps an ancient tower that might have existed well before the current age of Abrathian society. As we come back to everyone, actually put that up, yeah. As we come back to everyone, let us take a moment here and actually delve a little bit into the past. Let's go a few weeks back before Ada found her way uh, into the charge of all of her companions or leading the charge as it were, as technically she is the one responsible for this endeavor. Um, Ada, after leaving uh, the offices of uh, the High Mage that had entrusted you with this very, very important task in service to the Spires, you were taken a uh, to basically a different office, a much smaller office, um, one that uh, lacked a lot of the magically enhanced grown greenery uh, that you had found on the upper levels of the spire that um, perhaps maybe Ada is a little bit more comfortable in given her tiny office that she holds within the spire. Uh, and in this space, uh, Abreo, the... Um, dwarven gentleman that had tasked all of you, or tasked was tasked in the recruitment of all of you on this mission, bringing you into said office to discuss things a little bit further. It's definitely bigger than Ada's office, but still a little bit spartan. Give me an insight check before we begin. Okay. Nine. Nine. <laughs> so, Ada is probably a little bit bamboozled, I guess would be the best way to, to think of it, uh, overwhelmed by the experience uh, that she just had, not, you know, but a few moments before um, when she had her encounter with uh, the, the great Archmage Osion. And so she doesn't really pick up on some of the tension that might be in Abreu's voice uh, until he kind of almost snaps at her uh, and kind of pulls her focus back into the current situation and says, sit very abruptly before he moves behind his desk and sits down himself. She sits down very primly and just waits for his directive. As um, as Ada sits and starts taking in the situation, and Breo just sits there staring at her, and she starts to get a little bit uncomfortable. She feels some of that maybe anxiety that she had felt when she had been first called up to Osian's office until he clears his throat. <clears throat> this, just so you know young Ada. This situation is one that um, is very important, not just to the Spire, but very personally important to Osion. I hope you understand the significance of such a request that he has made of you. Yes, absolutely. And I will do everything in my power to keep things on the right track, to handle everything with um, <clears throat> all of the care and respect that is 
represented in the spires. Very good. Tell me, what do you know of the first age of Obreth? Um, a, a fair amount. Um, what do you think, Miko? Uh, as far as I mean, she would probably I mean, know as much. As, she would probably know as much yeah. as most historians know in Abrathian mm -hmm. society, and she certainly okay. knows well more than most Abrathians. Um, but I think Ada would also have the wherewithal to understand that she probably only knows a tiny scratching of the surface of that history mm -hmm. because it is far lost to time. Like, she knows that it occurred somewhere between eight and 10,000 years ago. Okay. Um, but there is no calendar reference for that time that anyone has been able to find there there's a calendar but no one knows what it means no one knows how it tracks to the current calendar um everything that everything that you have as far as that kind of age range of how long ago it was is based on magical divinations um and she would also know speaking of magic that magic doesn't work the same when it tries to divine that history there's something that causes divination to not be 100% accurate. There have been contradictions in divination and the written texts that have managed to be recovered from that age. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I, I know a fair bit, but um, if there's something specific that you're trying to, to get at, um, there's always more to learn, so. That's, um, that's a good way of looking at it. I'm glad that you at least have that quality for you. Tell me, do you have any knowledge of what it means to be um, going on this excursion? Well, um, I, I know as much as um, what I have been told thus far, you were there for, for all of that. Um, I know personally it means so much. Uh, this is an opportunity unlike anything that I've ever been presented with. So uh, once again, thank you for, for all of that. Um, and I, I'd imagine that it also uh, has has quite a lot of um, bearing on the understanding of Abrathian history, depending on what we uncover. Is it safe to say then that you are in this for the experience? Oh, a absolutely. I, well, also, I I was asked, and so, you know, I'm of course I'm gonna follow through. I mean, you don't turn down an offer like this, but yes, this happens to be, um, I mean, frankly, a, a dream for me. So, uh, this this should be um, quite an experience, and uh, one that I take very seriously, um, and I would promise to not. Um, disappoint. Hmm. How long have you been working in the spires? Uh, gosh, ever since I graduated. Um, so it's been quite a while now. She's a, a half elf. Um, so she looks fairly young, but she's been working in the spires, I would say, for uh, like 20 years at this point, perhaps. Um, so she's she's seasoned. As he reaches down uh, into his desk and pulls out a, a, a very large set of scrolls, uh, he unfurls them and starts flip, flipping through them a little bit. And he looks to you and says, and in all of that time, the position that you have managed to raise yourself to has never seen an avenue for promotion? Well, uh, from my understanding, um, I, I am the only one in this department. And so um, if if I were to leave, they'd have to find a suitable replacement. And I, I suppose nobody's come up yet. Um, and, you know, being that this is sort of a, an insulated uh, department, I, I suppose um, there's not a lot of growth within the overall structure of, of the system. Um, so, so yes, I, I have been in this, this role, uh, for, for quite a while. 
And what would you say if I told you that should this excursion go well and you bring very good light to Osayan, that we might be able to expand the department and perhaps place you at the head of it? Oh, um... <laughs> yes. Uh, that, that would be fantastic. Um, oh, wow. Uh, I don't... There's so many things that I could do if I had more help. Um, Indeed. Yes. That would be just the dream. Wonderful. Then I do believe you understand my meaning when I say that any mimetic crystals that you can bring back to deliver to myself and Osayan are dramatically important, not just for the Spire, but also for you. Absolutely, yes. Very good, then. I believe that I finally have a good sense and understanding of you now. I, I, I hope it's all good. Um, and I, I hope you know that, again, you can trust me to, to take on this, this job. And um, I hope to come back with just so much information and, uh, and the crystals as well. Very good. You are dismissed then. Thank you. Okay. And she'll get up and like walk to the door and just um, look back again. Thank you. Just thank you and head out. As uh, Ada leaves this office, uh, go ahead and give me another insight check, please. Oh boy. <laughs> Six. I think she's just over the moon. Like, oh, yeah. Head just. Twir swirling with ideas about that conversation so many ideas um if she has additional people i mean her mind is just just pinballing all over the place so uh yeah she she knows nothing beyond that awesome uh and yeah let us come back then uh to where we more or less left off uh at the end of last session the party itself, uh, having delved into to the ruins below um, and battled their way through the uh, experience, as it were, with uh, the sand drakes, um, feeling a bit de dehydrated themselves, um, bearing witness to the... Uh, where is that? Oh, shoot. I think I'm actually missing some art now i'm unhappy um oh, no. uh, yeah that's okay i can find it the hard way there we go uh as you delved into the deep into the ruins themselves um and found your way to what to at least Ada's eyes and probably to Val's eyes as well uh, is most notably very reminiscent of what the entrance to one of the Sendean spires looks like. This being ancient and definitely ruined from time and the activities that occur, uh, subterranean activities of the deserts. You all sat down. Uh, to take a rest and potentially recover from your dehydration. Are you guys taking a long rest or a short rest? Because you certainly have that luxury. It was getting into the evening uh, when you had encountered the drakes anyway, so. We had chatted about it. I know we wanted to move further in. But I think we had decided short rest. I don't remember. Correct me if I'm wrong. We're exhausted, right? Do we still have the point of exhaustion? You do still have that point of exhaustion. I So I think maybe we should try to find a safe place to take a long rest. I have a potion of watchful rest so I can stay awake. I might not be the most observant, but I can stay awake and still get the benefits of of uh, a full night's rest while you guys, um, while you guys actually sleep. We want sounds to do like that. a plan. Yeah, yes. sounds good to me. Yeah. Yep. There's definitely plenty of space uh, for you guys to to set up a modicum of a camp uh, down here near to this entrance. Uh, you're you're far enough distant from where you had encountered the sand rakes. Um, 
and that you believe that you would know if anything was coming that path um, or from that path. And there's not really much in the way of offshoots from this. So it's, it's either go inside and maybe look around a bit first or just rest here. I, I mean, w whatever is best for the group. Um, I am very curious, <laughs> a little, little tired, but. <laughs> well, uh, how about uh, some of us can can get started setting up the the camp. Uh, a couple of us can go scout uh, just to make sure that this area is safe. Um, well, we are in Valriel's world now. You know, I'm exhausted. I wouldn't mind taking a, taking a sleep. I am curious too. We're we're this is the beginning. You know, we're about to go in, and I think going in, well rested makes sense. You're right. It, it might be a good idea. And Walsh can read us another one of his poems. That's right. It would be my pleasure. As you all sit down, uh, scouting around a little bit is no problem for Reeves uh, at all. Um, you can go ahead and uh, use your passive perception or give me a perception check if you like. Uh, either way. Um, the rest I'll of you... I'll use my passive. Sorry. What is it? Uh, it's 17. Perfect. You uh, you feel pretty comfortable uh, in this space. Um, you go even go so far as to go back and check on the um, the the sand rakes, uh, and you find that they are already starting to decay, which is actually normal for a sand rake because they are comprised. Actually, they are magical creatures that are comprised mostly of sand, um, and so you're able to kind of suss out that at this point there's probably not any more in this little group uh, and your experience um, lets you know that they often are just in pairs. Okay. So um, as you come back to the entrance to, to join the others, you find that everybody else has mostly set up their their bedrolls uh, and such. There's no need for tents down here, thankfully. Um, and you make your way uh, more or less into a, a, a relatively restful state. The dehydration is still obviously impacting you some, but not enough to impede your ability to rest. Well, that's good. <laughs> okay. You have a lot of opportunity here to interact with each other if you wish. Well... I call this one Ode to the Kiss of the Sand and the Gentle Wind upon your face. That's a lot of haiku. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have one prepared, but watch <laughs> oh, the horns. Oh, <laughs> come on. <laughs> I mean I could I could try to come up with one real quick, let me think. Uh the let me see, the the ki the kiss of the sand. Along, along with the wind against your face feels lovely. That was a poem, Walsh. The title is about as long as the poem itself, but <laughs> yeah. uh, I can yeah, appreciate well, the arts. It's yeah. an it's a it's a statement, isn't it? It's an artistic statement. Is what really, that is. You really let the concept sink in uh, at, because you're sort of, you know, experiencing it twice uh, with the, yeah. the title and then the poem right. itself. No, it, yeah, exactly. Repetition. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice. It's sort of a subtle commentary on the, the madness that sinks in after you've been in the desert for too long. And the beauty within the madness. Yeah. You get it. Reeves understands. Wow. <laughs> Excuse me. Oh. Um, um, so for your amazing poetry, uh, Will, uh, the the Flan Blackmore has just donated bits to provide you an advantage that incredible. you can use. Fantastic. Just Will, not the rest of you. I mean, fair. I she deserves that. Absolutely. <laughs> incredible. Very nice. Thank you so much, uh, Flan. I am Super certain that it. that will become handy for for Walsh here soon. <laughs> Uh, before before we go to sleep uh, Val's gonna 
open up her geode again to get a 3D map of the area. And it's going to try her best to kind of um, sketch a little paper version of the map for everybody in case we get lost. Cool. Um, give me an arcana check, please. Oh, I got a 10 total with advantage. Okay. Um, <laughs> in this particular situation, I think Val is a little bit surprised um, at what she is reading because as she's drawing, the, 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 the geode itself opens up and starts displaying its illusory version of uh, a pseudo map of the environment within, what is it, 120 feet or something like that? Um, yeah. And as Val starts drawing it, she's looking back and forth between her drawing and the map, and the map keeps changing. She sees this almost like magical shift uh, in sections, basically anything beyond the door that she is resting. The cave that came up to this door is perfectly fine, but anything from beyond it, there's something interfering with the magic for Val to get an accurate reading. Um, I show everybody, I just walk up to everybody and be like, this it normally doesn't do that. <laughs> Do you see it? It's kind of shifting beyond this door. It, Have you seen that before? No, it's, well, it normally just shows me a map of whatever is here. But it seems that when you go beyond this door, it, it might change. I guess that does beg the question, is it, is it some sort of magical interference or is it physically rearranging itself? I don't know. Or magically rearranging itself. Well, yeah. I have a question as Kay um, about do? Reeves uh, take wanting to take a look because I don't remember what uh, if we're just in in tunnels that have been made by let's say the sand drakes or if um, there is some stonework there that indicates that there was some sort of the civilization. We know that we were in that, there was that tower, but I'm not sure exactly where we are now. Oh, um, so in this, in this particular instance, I think that Reeves in particular would genuinely feel a bit lost. I don't think that he's explored this deep. Uh, I think Val might even question just how deep that she is. Uh, and it's really hard to get it bearing comparatively from the above world to what it is down here. Um, well, uh, does it look like anyone else has been here in the last millennia? Can we no. determine that? No. No. Uh, it's It's... Any signs of life down here would be completely gone from Reeve's perspective. Okay. I'm sure there's very uh, ominous droning and echoing <laughs> as we are just hanging out in here. But. Um, as we're kind of, you know, settling in at some point, um, Ada will go over to Val for a moment. Um, are you doing okay after, um, you know, all of that sort of energy siphoning and all of that? Uh, um, I think so. Um, why? Why do you ask? I just, um, I don't know, uh, it's kind of a surreal experience, and that can be a lot to handle, um, I am I aware. Did, I did feel something in your library when we were in there. Really? Yeah. Huh. Like what? Uh... Like I was, it's going to sound weird. Like I was close to an ascendant of some kind, but not. 
Really? Oh, that's yeah. interesting. Okay. Huh. And okay, just for my understanding, what happened exactly? Like when I know you said that you sort of experienced something while you were unconscious. Uh, is that? Did you? Do you have any memory of what that was, or? Um, I don't remember, honestly. Okay. It kind of just happened so fast. I felt comfort. I felt, felt like I understood. I felt understood. Um, and then it was gone. Okay. All right. Well, I'm I'm glad that it, you know, was um, a positive experience overall. Um, yeah. Just I just wanted to check on you, and she'll sort of <laughs> scuttle away before any other uh, conversation can happen. Okay. Bye. B bye. As I think as. Oh, sorry, Will, just give me one second here. As Ada starts to to scuttle away, um, she feels and she feels as if her mother just looked at her with a tisking expression. She starts walking away. She stops and turns around and goes back and sits down next to Val again. <laughs> okay, so here's what I think happened to you because it's kind of what happened to me. Um, I, th I think you're right on the money um, that you did in fact encounter an ascendant. Um, welcome to the club, it's fantastic here. Uh, and it, it sounds like based on what you're describing um, that it maybe was also um, the ascendant that I'm familiar with, Lunyesh. Are you familiar? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I know the ascendants, but you know, a lot of it is folklore, right? Like it's not. I mean, it's real, but it's not real. Like it's been so long, but they don't interact with us, or well, not usually. Uh, I, I don't think it's, you know, like a an everyday thing. And I, and I know that some ascendants sort of, um, I guess, come in and out of, of their, I, would, I don't want to say power, but sort of like presence in certain areas. And, um, well, I, I, I think that Munyesh has been, I mean, she's, they've been around for, for a while um, here in Aubrath. And, um, wow. Yeah. So I, I'm I'm fairly certain that that's what you've experienced now uh, as well. And and what does it mean? What what do I do with that? I mean, I think that there's a lot of time to figure that out. I I mean I don't want to tell you <laughs> what to do with this situation, I guess. Um, I have had a few interactions at this point uh, with, with Lunyesh, and th they've all been overwhelmingly positive. Um, so I imagine that this is a good thing for you. Um, you said that you felt comforted and sort of, you know, just good overall. Is that right? Yeah, understood. I think it's the best way to name it gosh that's a really good feeling um wow it is yeah wow well i suppose uh, let me know if um they interact with you anymore uh i i mean I it happened when i touched that that uh curd drip same i kind of you know play, played it off a little bit right there but I, I also sort of uh, psychically exploded into magical, mystical, ascendant realm and had 
what can only be described as like a life altering experience. Um, oh, wow. Okay. And, what did you experience? Oh my God. Uh, well, uh, you know, um, sort of, I mean, essentially just, just what you were saying about, you know, feeling understood and, um, and, and cared for. And, um, I, I sort of felt like, well, I sort of felt like Lunyesh was, um, I guess at least a little bit proud of me. At least I think that's what that feeling was. Um, but I've, I've been sort of doing, um, not even things on their behalf, but I suppose, uh, applying the tenets of, of their, uh, existence in my daily life. And, um, <laughs> because of that, I now can do some things, um, that I couldn't do before. Like just for your information, I don't need to sleep like ever. It's not a thing that I need to do. Um, I like to rest. Resting is good. And I, and I definitely <laughs> need to be resting now. Um, but I, yeah, I, um, I don't know. I, I, I just felt like it was another good interaction. Thank you for sharing. Um, I'll definitely let you know if that happens again. Please. Well, resting feels weird in front of other people when you don't sleep. I don't really know. I mean, you could hang out with Falstaff or... Yeah. Uh, Reeves is going to sleep with his eyes open, so that could be fun. That's not exactly comforting. Um, I suppose yeah. I could observe, you know. Have a staring contest. <laughs> I, I don't well, think I'd win that. Falstaff waves at you from across the campfire. Falstaff is, is the right choice, um, especially, <laughs> did you see what they did? With the big fight? I mean, come on. I, I really need to understand a little bit more about how they operate and sort of uh, just, wow, very impressive. Can't very, very impressive. Absolutely. Well, I hope that you get some good rest. I, I know you were put through the ringer here. So, um, yeah, she's so awkward and she'll just get up and go over and sit next to the mechanical monkey. <laughs> So uh, as the awkwardness of the, the conversation subsides, um, uh, Kay and Will are Reeves and uh, Walsh doing anything in particular before we finish Walsh, the rest. Walsh probably requires the most sleep as the only human here, but uh, before going to sleep, I think he definitely would have gone to Val and said, you want to let me take a look at that thing and just make sure it's working properly? Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, and I would like to examine it. Uh, maybe I can tell if it's functioning as it's supposed to. That would seem to suggest that the uh, the ruin itself is physically changing or magically changing. Uh, go ahead and uh, give me an arcana check, please. Cool. I'll do that. Uh, 19. 19. It is functioning perfectly. Um, however, I will say that with the 19 and pretty, cause you're, are you expertise in Arcana or just proficient? Uh, neither actually. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I think the idea was that he, he is yeah. very good at building things, but not necessarily understanding the magical aspect of them. Okay. Okay. I can, yeah, I can buy that. Uh, I think in this in this instance, I think um, Walsh really picks up on the notion that it is functioning perfectly and something externally is influencing it. Okay. All right. That makes sense. Cool. Then, Doesn't know uh, what that is. Has no concept of, of what that might even be, but... <laughs> right. Yeah, absolutely. He's... Uh, I've, I'm picturing him. He's like um, the kind of engineer who works on cars, but, you know, didn't go to school for it or anything like that. So, um, he knows how it works, but not necessarily why it works. And he is going to bring the device back to Val and hand it over and say, um, it seems to be working, but there's some kind of, uh, interference that it's picking up. So at least I think the place is, uh, in a fixed position. 
but I'm still so, not sure exactly how reliable it's going to be. Okay, fair enough. At least, like, if we go through the door, we're not all going to be transported to a different place, I guess. Yeah. No, I don't think it's going to drop out from under us. I don't fair think enough. it's going to drop out from under us. We shall see. Uh, Kay, did you have anything for Reeves? I imagine that, like, uh, he said, like, hey, you guys you guys get set up. Uh, I'm going to go scout. And then he came back and no one set his stuff up. So he's just been, like, setting him, himself up for, for when he is like, oh, I'm going to be up all night uh, I, I, watching. So I might as well be comfy. So he's just been spending a lot of time just being like, fucking, freaking, it's fucking sucking. Yeah. If, if you'll if you'll allow me, Will, I think as you're doing that, um, Falstaff, uh, who is a very helpful in creature, like everybody else is a little bit distracted, right? But Falstaff sees you uh, and immediately just comes over yeah. and starts assisting Reeves Aww. in setting up all of his stuff because that's kind of his job for Walsh. A lot of the time is to like help him and and fix stuff and like helper you monkey. Know, yeah. Yeah, he's a little helper monkey, and I think he comes over and starts helping. Uh, and he's is he small sized creature or is he a medium sized creature? I forget. I think he's tiny, actually. Oh, tiny, even better. So, like, I feel like, uh, I mean, even ti tiny is still like you know almost two feet tall, right? Or can be as much as almost two feet tall. So, I feel like as he comes over and starts helping, there's instances where he, he like is he like fluffs out the bedroll and it like falls on his head and he's like a little tiny ghost monkey running around Love for a it. second and yeah i'll be like you're the best part of this team you're the <laughs> you're the most valuable you kill things yeah you, you help things help us get things done you're the best he's gonna get his own animated spinoff from this game <laughs> yeah yes <laughs> Hey, Incredible. I still at some point completely off topic. I want to run uh, that uh, that familiars uh, one sheet game that's uh, been going around. Have you guys seen that? Where everybody plays mm -hmm. a familiar uh, to to their uh, you know spellcaster and has to go on a rescue mission. I <laughs> sign me up for that. Yeah. I, I love that. I love that. Anyway, so you guys are able to uh, finish or you know. Get, start and finish your long rest without issue so you can update your character sheets i will also say that part of the long rest involves you guys like eating some food and drinking some water and stuff and as soon as you as soon as any of you start drinking your water the dehydration pretty much goes away instantly um as as if maybe if any of you had been proficient in medicine you might have been able to <laughs> to realize that after the battle <laughs> Just a bunch of knuckleheads, you know? <laughs> Feels like Just an oversight, but on whose people, part? Don't, don't ever discount medicine as a skill. It, it can be useful. Yeah. <laughs> All I'm um, saying is we didn't put this team together. Frank did. That's true. <laughs> I mean, he, you guys said that you were skilled. Anyway, um, as you guys uh, settle in for your rest... Um, Reeves, I f in this instance, um, as you're trying to find yourself going off to sleep, you hearken back to memories as your arm, the the, the spot on the back of your hand and uh, wrist begins to itch furiously. It brings your memories back to a few years ago now when you had finally gotten through your circumstances, we'll say, with the, the legal systems of Aubrath. And you were having your final conversation with the man that had been overseeing your release and integration into civilized society since you had opted not to return to your country of origin and stay within Aubrathian society. There was a term that you had to serve, several years, in fact, probably more years than Reeves would have liked, but he settled in nonetheless to the difficulties associated because no matter how difficult it was, it still wasn't as bad as where he came from for him. And so there he sits in the offices of Joran, the man that had been overseeing everything about his life for so many years. A man that he came, Reeves came to respect 
um, because Joran didn't take any crap from Reeves, but he also treated Reeves quite fairly overall as things go. Um, and there he sees him sitting across the, the desk, uh, sipping a little bit of uh, cold tea, which is a luxury for him uh, in the desert offices. There you stand completely covered in dust and desert sands from having just come back on another successful job, thereby proving your worth and value to the rest of Albrathian society. And he sits there, not as old as Reeves, but old for a human. Um, you can see the wrinkles uh, in his eyes, the graying in his hair, the, 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 the perhaps little bit of increase in weight that uh, uh, comes with old age from living a perhaps too sedentary life. And he sips his tea and complains to you, oh, another month and I get to finally retire. Should be nice, I hear. Uh, Albrathians have a pretty nice uh, retirement plan generally, or? I mean, mine's better than most, I guess. I, it's enough. I'm going to find myself a, a little place um, outside of the capital, I think, just along the river there and spend my days fishing, I guess. You know, I've never fished. I imagine you have to be pretty close to, to the river to fish. Uh, living in the city, I find you hard-pressed to find anything. Well, I mean, the capital is right there on the river, but I can't stand that place. Who can? Anyway. So tell me, Reeves, how are you feeling about all of this? This is your last day, right? Yep. Yeah. Uh, I've been waiting a long time. Um, excited to finally live, I guess. And, um because I'm required to ask you this question. Do you feel like you have paid your debt to society? Plenty times over. And I will continue to. Um, everyone has their own debt to society and, uh, you know, it's lifelong maybe. Yeah. It's fair. You know, I like you, Reeves. Have you thought about the process for citizenship? I somewhat I um I was just waiting to get out I didn't really think about much after that but do you do you know how am I even like able to, to qualify for that after today I mean I'm not gonna say it's gonna be um gonna be easy it's uh it's hard it's um it's a difficult proposition for people from your circumstance but uh Abrathians aren't quite as xenophobic as Briostans, and I think you can do it. Uh, it's just a question of how long it's going to take. Uh, it's not going to be easy, my friend. Uh, easier than where... <laughs> I don't know how if you heard much from the sovereignty, but uh, sure, anything is easier than that. I mean, it's hard to know what's truth and what's not. Some of the stories that have come out of the sovereignty are insane. I'm surprised anything has come out of there. I mean, we get some of... What, what do they call uh, the people that aren't citizens again? Kansa something or other? Uh, in Kansa, yes. In Kansa, yeah. We get a few of them that have crossed over. I mean, most of them that try die in the desert, but um, some of them that have managed to, to make their way in becomes a little bit newsworthy in the, the gossip sheets. Mm. Oh, keep clear. I never asked. Were you in in Kansa? Con, in Kansa? Uh, Reeves will just square up and s stare him directly in the eye till he decides to change the subject. All right. Fair enough. None of my business. Doesn't matter on the citizenship paperwork anyway. Um, you know I can't sponsor you. But uh, I'd be willing to fill out the paperwork and maybe get things started for you if it's the path you want to go down. Um, 
you know, might as well get it started. And if I decide not to, I at least got part way through it. We'll see. I feel like I need to make sure you understand, though. This might take a few years. It's it's going to be hard. I've been waiting a few years to, to <laughs> get out of the prison, so. Well, I can wait a few more. It, that itch on your wrist uh, might go away before the uh, the paperwork actually gets processed correctly and you get it. So try not to get um, try not to get too disheartened heart too disheartened. All right. Sure. Thank and, you. And uh, if you ever find your way near the capital, maybe take a jaunt north and see if you find a little shack with an old man fishing in in the river. I'd be happy to sit down and share some tea with you. Thank you. I'm going to teach a man to fish. We'll see. Oh, you know how to fish? No, you teach me how to fish. You teach me how to... It's a Briost saying. Never mind. Oh. Jeez. That's weird. <laughs> and he okay. stands up and kind of squares his shoulders. He's a little bit taller than Reeves, which is saying something. Um, uh, and he's certainly heavier than Reeves. Uh, but um, he squares up and, you know, has this uh, bit of respect about uh, his stance as he extends a hand to Reeves to shake. Uh, I have a very firm, respectful shake, one that is trying to convey that I'm not going to be back here. Um, yeah. I'll get your paperwork started, my friend. Thank you. And as we come back into the, the moment and Reeves contemplates how many years ago that was and he's still going through the process... Does he feel disheartened? Does he feel like maybe this job might actually be worthwhile? I think he's... In regards to um, citizenship, I think he's pretty much given up on the idea. He's going through the motions. He doesn't know what else to really... What else to kind of point his... Um, his fix his star too i don't know i don't know what the right what the no, right phrase i'm looking for it that's but, a good uh, phrase yeah he's uh he's not sure exactly where he's going he's just you know still going towards citizenship because it's the only thing he knows about so all right off he drifts to um get the the pseudo rest that comes with drinking the the po that he drank uh his attention is still full but his mind wanders as the the magic of it kind of settles in and takes over allowing his body to still find respite uh even though he is technically awake and you all finished your long rest as you each awaken in the proximity to morning that you have as for the first time perhaps for many of you ever uh you awaken without sunlight uh beating down upon you um in the the darkness that is splotchy or splattered with a splotchy luminescence from a bioorganic things that are attached to the various walls around you uh there you find yourselves standing once again, having packed up all of your things, feeling you're refreshed, standing in front of the door, ready to enter the ruin. What do you do? Uh, Walsh is going to say, right, what, one moment, these damn things don't last very long. And he's going to pull out the eye drops again. And he's just going to uh, apply his his uh, hourly dose. Perfect. Fair enough. To give himself dark vision. At this point, I think Walsh, having used these now more than he's ever used them before, is probably starting to feel a little bit of burn in his eyes. His eyes are definitely looking bloodshot to, to the rest of you. Um, he's a little bleary-eyed from it, but after a moment, that clears away, and, and he's able to see just, just fine. Well... I was going to ask if it was like when you have contact lenses and you sleep with them. It would probably be a similar feeling. 
but mm-hmm. very much so. Definitely. <laughs> Except oh. you wake up and it's just completely black. <laughs> <laughs> Val will walk towards the door yeah. and mm-hmm. kind of point at it and ask Ada, have you seen this kind of door before? No. It's, I mean, it's it's kind of like doors from the spires, but nothing this magnificent to Ada. I mean, you'd think that, I mean, it's a, it's a door. How differently can they all work? But uh, I certainly know better than that. I, I would imagine you've come across something not necessarily exactly like this but i know. think this nice you know <laughs> i this is i've never seen anything this ornate down here before well how do you usually go about deciding how to interact with something like this what's your process i check the door for traps and then make my way through but this door and with what my geode is saying on the other side is happening i'm a little bit more cautious uh before going into this one Hmm. hey reeves you want to go first (laughs) (laughs) um i suppose i could uh are you going to investigate the door for traps? Yeah, I will investigate okay. the door for traps. Roll first. an investigation check for me. It's very generous of you before you send Reeves through it. <laughs> You're on a natural one. <laughs> for seven? Yeah, this door is perfect in every way. It's, well, also, I... it's also technically unlocked. Technically. Um, I'm suspicious of the way that Val called me over and then and then she's like, oh, oh no, it's actually it's just fine. I don't trust her at all for this. <laughs> I I have heard a little bit about her um, from the grapevine and I do not trust her. So I'm going to use my metal of muscle, hoping that maybe it's just like a spear is going to get thrown at me. Um, so uh, using my metal of muscle turns gives me advantage on strength checks and strength saving throws for an hour. Once it's been used, it can't be used again, and then the thing becomes unmagical. So I'm going to just push open the door or nice. pull the door, whichever uh, way. It's a push. The, the, it's a very large double doors. Like the, the doors themselves are almost 20 feet in height, and each side of the double doors is about seven feet wide. Um, and so uh, you drink this potion and like brace yourself to push it open brace for you know flying saw blades and spears and arrows and poison explosions as you shove the doors open uh and none of that happens okay and as you look inside you see a very 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 large chamber that is a combination of natural earth that you that any of you with any type of uh, intelligence or knowledge are able to ascertain is probably a result of like shifting tectonics and things that have occurred down here um, over the many, many, many centuries that this has existed. Um, And very, very cracked and almost turned to rubble fine stonework. Um, This combination of just ramshackle rubble and everything in your way almost gives you a sense of pause as you look through the space and you see no immediate danger. The the cavern itself um, uh, easily goes beyond the edges of your dark vision, uh, which may be a result of the, the tectonic activity that resulted in this portion of the tower having fallen so far beneath the earth and it's just been pulled apart uh, in so many ways Um, but you see no immediate dangers how's it looking Um, you're all standing there right behind him so (laughs) yeah yeah. (laughs) with a trained eye though I mean I'm gonna sneak into the room and and try to um, get a look around all right Give me a perception check and a stealth check, please. Okay. And remember, you can always use your passive for stealth, for, for perception if you wish. Uh, my stealth was 18. Excellent. And I have expertise, and my 
Uh, perception also 18, also with expertise. Amazing. So those of you that are watching Reeves uh, see a man who is very practiced uh, in trying to sneak up on prey. Uh, and he immediately takes a stance and walks with near perfect silence, uh, stepping through the archways. As he steps through, Ada and Val, both of you catch the faintest glimmer of a magical light that kind of silhouettes Reeves for just the briefest of moments. You can both roll arcana checks if you wish. Yeah. 22. Amazing. 16. Okay. Um, so Ada is able to ascertain almost immediately that that was some kind of protective spell uh, or protective magic that was triggered uh, in stepping through that did no harm to Reeves. Okay. Reeves, can you hear us on Reeves this end? Has n it does not turn back to look at you. Reeves, you cannot hear any of this at the moment. Okay. I, I'm probably correct then. Um, Reeves just walked through a magical uh, portal of some kind or um, wall, I, I guess. And uh, now he can't hear us and I don't know what the effects of this will be. So um, that's where we're at. Who's next? Oh, we're, we're all going through it then i mean it's the way forward i'll go i'll go and she'll just get through uh as ada steps through i need for her to make a charisma saving throw please okay am i just not charismatic enough to have <laughs> <laughs> not related uh it's a 26 26 uh <laughs> she feels in her mind a attempt at divination to ascertain her purpose. She has no concept of what the source is, but she understands intrinsically that it was her innate magic that set this off. It doesn't bar her from entry. She mm -hmm. feels the same protective ward kind of wash over her just the faintest little bit. And if she did not have that, that innate magic that she possesses, she wouldn't be able to probably wouldn't have even noticed but she steps through without harm and okay. is fine and as she steps through she notices now that there is a distinct difference in the sound of the two spaces Ooh. there's a feeling that comes over her as she steps through something more magical about this place than anywhere she's ever been in her life. And she's been to the central temples. Oh, wow. Uh, Reeves? Are you feeling Reeves this? Reeves hears. Uh, I, I guess I snapped to her, to it. Uh, feeling, um, just a, just a, a whole lot of magic just all around. I close my eyes and talk to my ranger senses. I feel nothing. Is that, is that about right? <laughs> no, that's not true, actually. When he refocuses his efforts to not looking for things that are meant to harm him, when he opens up his senses in the ways that, you know, his... Um, the magical essence, when he starts actively looking for something more magical as he is trained to do with his Gloomstalker abilities, he f starts to feel a faint inkling of what Ada is indicating. But then also he feels something else. He feels a rumbling underneath of his feet. Very faint. Ada does not pick up on this. Oh, and he feels as though, it's, as though it's getting stronger. Like, uh, I'll point to our feet that there's something coming, um, and I'll look at the others, and um, I'll make the gestures that everyone knows for something underground is coming. Um, <laughs> that's, that's what that looks like. 
Yeah, yeah I figure it's some sort of a worm, another sand drake, something. Okay, um, sure, fair. Um, I would say Val at the very least picks up on that. Walsh has no freaking clue, <laughs> and Ada well, is just too inexperienced to recognize it. I was gonna ask, did we go through the portal? Uh, no one has gone through a portal. Uh, er, uh, okay. Walsh, Walsh, and Val are still standing. Uh, they have not walked through the doors just yet. Right. Right. Okay. Uh, I think we're. It, Walsh is gonna pause and without looking at Val, is going to say, well, if we were going to break contract and run, now would be the time. Yeah, run this time. You know, if I had a dollar for every dumb thing I did, I'd be rich. And she's just going to go run right into the, <laughs> the portal. All right. You step through the doors. Uh, you do not need to make a charisma saving throw. You do, because you had previously seen the effect upon Reeves and Ada, you're able to kind of feel the slight sensation as if walking through some kind of protective magic that does not harm you. Um, and yeah, you step into the space. Does Walsh and Falstaff follow suit? Yeah, well, Walsh will take a deep breath and say, in for a penny, and we'll step through likewise. All right. Uh, as Walsh and Falstaff step through the space, all of you begin to now feel the slight rumbling sensation beneath your feet. Does um, anyone I, do anything in response? I am going. Is is there anywhere that any anyone can get up, um, or any large rocks they could stand on? And yeah. I want to use my pre, um, primeval awareness. awareness. Yeah, so as an action, I expend a ranger spell slot um, to sense whether any aberrations, celestials, dragons, elementals, fey, fiends, or undead are present within one mile. Uh, there is a, the strong presence of one of those beings coming towards you from beneath your feet. Rapidly. There is plen also, there is plenty of rubble around and debris for you guys to climb up upon without having to roll any checks. It will reduce your movement speed because it counts as difficult terrain, but you don't have to worry about rolling any silly like athletics checks or anything. Uh, if you want to jump up on platforms and, you know, pillars and stuff, we'll get into that stuff. But there's plenty of other things that you could get off of the floor, as Reeves is suggesting, if you wish. I'll cast Featherfall yep. on everyone. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay. I've been in cavens. I don't yeah. know if, if the ground is rumbling. I'm I'm assuming it's we're fallen. Uh, Walsh is not going to try to like do anything fancy. He's just going to try to get his feet off of the ground itself and into a position. Um, Falstaff, who can fly, uh, is kind of just going to hover around or at sure. least circle overhead. Nice. Uh, and Ada. Oh, Ada's following orders here so she's gonna she's gonna go up uh to slightly higher ground <laughs> and then reeves are you doing anything else since, since you feel this presence coming towards you i'm towards going to if everyone is kind of over in a like let's say a semicircle on one side i'm going to run to the like the opposite side so if it came let's say something came out of the ground and looked at me uh it would have its back to everyone else. Uh, I couldn't Perfect. So yeah, them. You, you go rushing further into the room. As you start rushing, you can feel the sensation of this uh, force because you still have your awareness up um, coming towards you uh, more rapidly and more directly as it knows from your footfalls where you're going um yeah. and as the rest of you kind of climb up uh into the space uh i need for everyone to roll initiative as bursting from the ground throwing debris uh and uh stonework uh out of the way you see this very very large elemental like being just erupt from the ground uh, elemental energies of all kinds glowing from the various parts of its body uh, as oh, and Reeves you actually need to make a dexterity saving throw I'm sorry because you are still okay. on the ground dexterity sure uh, that is 21 dex nice 
you uh, you are able to keep your feet just fine uh, as you are somewhat <laughs> thrown uh, a, a little bit deeper uh, into the room. Uh, this creature stands almost 12, 15 feet from head to toe. Uh, it is large uh, and very imposing. Uh, I need your initiative rolls, please. Uh, respectable five. All right. Right. An even more respectable 11. Nice. Got a 16. Nice. The, the most respected uh, nat 20, so 24. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> disrespectful. I guess disrespectful to whatever this thing is. <laughs> yeah. Good. Yeah. All right. So, uh, Reeves, as you are thrown from, uh, all tr as with an attempt to actually throwing you from your feet, uh, your dexterity managing to catch yourself with your uh, trained footwork uh, and this being lifting itself up out of the ground, you notice that the ground itself seems to almost seal up underneath mm -hmm. of it uh, as if it is fluid with the earth um, and it is obviously bearing down upon you with threat and menace it is your turn uh, booby trap I say to myself um, <laughs> no one else can hear me uh, and then uh, I guess I'll I'll take out my sickles and uh, I'll do a, um, a zephyr strike on myself so advantage on one weapon attack roll on my turn and then if I hit that, then I get extra damage. Nice. I'm oh. assuming that you're going to close in to engage with damage uh, oh, to strike it. Okay. As you close in, uh, I will say that you can feel like the hair on the back of your neck begins to stand up. Uh, you feel, oh, DM Dave throwing out some hey. bits for everybody. Oh, yeah. Uh, Thank that's you, Dave. Advantage for everyone. So that's two that you have currently, Will. Just keep that in mind. Nice. Uh, thank you so much, Dave. They're, they might need it. Um, uh, you can feel not only the hair on the back of your neck stand up, but you can feel this simultaneous waves of hot and cold kind of wafting off of it uh, that causes weirdness uh, as you reach out and strike it. Um, you got a 19, what was that? 19 to hit, yes. Yeah, uh, and this is your, uh, the magical sickle? Yes, my sickle yeah. plus one. You easily strike into it. Uh, go ahead and do some damage. Nice. Um, okay, so I'm going to uh, favorite foe it. I'm going to... Do I get sneak attack because I have advantage? Yes. Even though it's on me. Nice. Yes. So that's a 1d6 plus this. That's terrible. 4 plus 1d6. 3. And then I get a d8 from Zephyr Strike. Nice. Ouch. Um, so <laughs> this is just rolled really shittily. <laughs> that's all right. What kind of damage is Zephyr Strike? So Zephyr Strike is force damage. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then I guess That's the other would be slashing, piercing. Slashing, yeah. Yeah, you, you cut into it. Uh, you tear a chunk of earth uh, out of its thigh um, as, like, it's hard for you to reach much higher than its waist. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you tear a chunk out of it. Do you have anything else or you, another attack maybe? Uh, I think I do because of my rapier. I get extra 10 feet, and I think I get a second. Um, okay, so I will hit again. I'll try to hit again with my Moonsicle. That okay. is 23 to hit. Yeah, that hits. Okay. And then that's another four slashing. So. All right. Every little that's bit, man. Every little bit. Uh, yeah, you... you slice into it a couple of times it doesn't seem overly phased by your strikes uh, as it seems more focused on your presence than anything else uh, that brings us to Val you're, um, you're currently like up a little ways all of you the the space that you're in you're probably all approximately 30-ish feet uh, away from it with Va or with uh, Reeves just on the other side of it as he had planned okay um, is there any cover or rubble or anything that the Val could kind of get a bit closer but not too close and, uh, and kind of yeah, there's, there's plenty somewhere. there's plenty of that in this space you wouldn't even really have to move from your current spot because you had all kind of climbed up um, but you would need to make a stealth check yeah absolutely I will then just take two shot or take a shot with my uh, short bow 
Do you want to do here? the stealth check first? So no, I'll hide after advantage. I shoot. Okay, gotcha. I, I assume I get advantage because Kay's in, engaged. You don't get advantage, but you do still get your sneak attack. All right. Um, I'm just going to shoot. I feel like I just shoot Go for it. right away. Yeah, do it. That's a nine. Nine, unfortunately, misses. Uh, your your arrow from your short bow just goes whizzing uh, off to the, to the side, uh, a fair, decent bit off from your mark. Damn. I will hide. Right. <laughs> give, me, give me a stealth check, please. A little embarrassed. It's a 10. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you don't feel very confident in anything that you just did. Yeah. Just throwing that out there. Pa panic yeah. cast, feather fall, totally yeah. with a shot, try to hide. <laughs> yep. uh, and that's going to make it uh, the elemental's turn. Uh, so as it is looking at you, Reeves, very much focused on you, doesn't really have a sense of the others just yet, doesn't seem to care. Uh, it's going to uh, first let loose a cold burst. So... Um, this aura of magical cold energy just wafts off of it. Uh, and since you are within five feet of it, you need to make a constitution saving throw of DC 15, please. Uh, 24. Uh, <laughs> great. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, you still do take six points of cold damage from it. But the cool thing um, doesn't happen. I see. The, uh, right. As you feel this cold energy kind of uh, flow over you, you can feel your joints and your bones just start to, their muscles start to like stiffen up a little bit, but you like shake it off uh, and you are not impeded by it. But you don't feel like you want to continue to stay within proximity to this thing uh, yeah, as fair. it then goes to bring one of its, uh, one of its heavy um, stone fists down upon you. Uh, that is a 15 to hit, which I think misses you, right? Uh, that just hits actually. Oh, yeah. okay. Uh, <laughs> let's see. That is going to be 12 points of bludgeoning damage nice. as it slams down upon you. Uh, and as it pulls its fist back, uh, you can see this aura of lightning uh, electricity kind of form around its fist as if it's preparing to do something. I hate that. And it is Walsh's turn. So the first thing Walsh is going to do is going to he's going to say full stop. Let's light it up, and the little mechanical flying monkey is going to zoom to the other side of the cavern, find a outcropping of rock to lock onto with his uh, little tiny claws, and is going to once again sort of mode shift panels and gears and things are going to shift around on his body as the cannon barrel emerges from inside his chassis. And at the same time, Walsh is going to pull out the arcane firearm and like start to rotate through the barrels again. He's going to pause and he's going to say, Ada, does fire work on this thing? She has no concept yet. I hope so. <laughs> well, we're about to find out. And um, I'm going to do, I'm going to cast a firebolt through my arcane firearm. All right. Roll to hit. All right. 18. 18 does hit. Uh, but don't bother rolling damage because your firebolt, as it slams into this thing's back, you can actually see the fire not even fully come into contact with it as its aura of cold just seems to to wash the, the fire and diminish it to practically nothing. But it does turn its head and look back towards you and you can see the red glow uh, in its featureless face kind of brighten for a brief moment. That, that's a no on the fire, everybody. Uh, and then Falstaff is going to, uh, that, that, that sort of hum of ambient magical energy is going to sound as the cannon in Falstaff's chest starts to glow, and he is going to fire a force ballista with like a thum out at this thing. And hopefully that'll do more if we can oh, hit. Oh, an artillery monkey. 15. 15 misses. Can I spend my poetry advantage? Sure, I'll let you do that. Okay. <laughs> Normally I wouldn't because I told you the results, but I, I'm being generous. Well, I got a lower number anyway, so. I'm sorry. <laughs> As is fitting. 
That's okay. Uh, is that it for Walsh's turn? All right, that's all I got. All right, Ada, I just witnessed the, the fire elemental energies not work upon this elemental creature. What would you like to do? Uh, she does not like this. She's freaked out, and she'll just throw her hands up and uh, cast some Eldritch Blasts. Let her in. That's what, that's what she knows how to do. <laughs> Ugh, okay. The first is a 13, so... That misses, no unfortunately. The second is a 27. Yeah, that's a distinctly better roll and does, in fact, hit. That is great. Uh, and, oh, I have an additional genie's wrath damage of three points. So the total is eight points of nice. damage. Ascendance and, wrath. Oh, that's Ascendance right. Yes, wrath. yes, yes. Ascendance wrath. Yes. Um, how... It, has has it moved at all from where it is? Are we still about 30 feet distance? Okay. Yeah, you're still about 30 feet distance. It did not move. It, it Right before you guys got to do anything, it definitely viewed Reeves as the, the most uh, distinct threat. Okay. Um, I am going to stay where I am for now. Uh, TBD on how that goes, though. We'll see. All right. Uh, that brings us back to Reeves. Uh, <laughs> he did not like getting squished very much. Um, I mean, I don't imagine so. It's not a ton <laughs> that he can do about it. Uh, so just gonna, uh, I guess just try to hit again. That's all I got. That is 18 hit with my moonsicle. Bam. Slice, slice, slice. And that is five. All right. Anything else? I don't think so. Uh, I might uh, take a potion if I can. Bonus action gonna, to consume your own potion. Yeah. I'm going to have just the potion of healing. I'm going to just take nine. Cool. You you feel the, the iron taste of these potions uh, that perhaps are not, they're not, ineffective but there might be a little stale uh as uh, as you drink it down uh it nonetheless does start to bind up magically some of the wound from the uh intense cold that had struck into you previously uh and that's going to bring us back to val you are not hidden i am afraid val you did not beat its passive perception it knows that you are there so you do not gain advantage on your roll uh, unless you Fair wish enough. to use something else that could do so great so val thinks that she's hidden, sitting on her, sitting behind a rock, um, takes a deep breath, um, you know, feeling embarrassed, but trying to trying to calm down a bit. Um, they're gonna pop up, and I will use steady aim to get advantage, that and then work. we'll we'll fire. It's uh, twenty five. Yeah, that'll hit. Perfect. And you do get sneak attack. Okay. Seven plus 11, so it's 18 points of damage. Nice. Uh, yeah, it definitely did not like that strike uh, as, it, as the arrow slams into its back and a huge chunk of elemental uh, earth just falls out from where the, the arrow embedded. It turns and looks towards you and does not turn back to face Reeves. She, like shrink back under the rock that she was hiding in <laughs> or thinking she was hidden in. Okay. Uh, it is now its turn. Uh, I'm assuming you're, you're done, right? Because you can't move if you use steady aim. So yeah, you're done trying to shrink yourself down to be smaller. Uh, Reeves, you all of a sudden feel the ground around you start to shake uh, as this thing dives into the ground. Uh, you do get an opportunity attack on it, though. I will take it. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. That's 14 to hit. That just misses, I am afraid. <laughs> Um, well, it missed by two. Uh, and so it 
as it, the the earth kind of opens up beneath it almost and just abs- it absorb it gets absorbed into the ground beneath uh you can see a physical change in the the ground and the rubble as it moves up uh and starts to burst forth from beside val uh and it stands above you val uh and uh Oh, actually, wait. No, you're on the rubble, uh, which is not just comprised of earth and stone. So I have to change that a little bit. It does still move away. It moves to within about 20 feet of you, diving into the ground, kind of appearing up beside on the uh, on the side of the rubble. Um, and then you see the electricity form in its fist as it lashes a hand out towards you and an arc of electricity starts to fly towards you to wrap around. Uh, that is a 19 to hit. Does that hit Val? Could I, could I cast shield? I don't know. Do you have a reaction? Uh, yeah, I think so. I didn't use it. I'd right. like to cast shield. <laughs> okay. You cast shield. Does that mean that the 19 no longer hits? Oh, my math is bad. My AC is 19. <laughs> uh, I am afraid 19 still hits you then. Uh, as as you put up your shield, the, uh, the lightning lash wraps around your shield, and then you feel it course as the electricity wraps around you too. Uh, you take 13 points of lightning damage, and I need you to make a DC 15 strength saving throw, please. I got 15. That succeeds. Uh, You are not pulled closer to it uh, as you feel as you feel the lash attempt to to yank you towards this beast. You put your the edge of your uh, uh, bow into the ground and lock your feet down and lean back. And just as you're about to be flung towards the the creature the lash lets loose uh, as if you had just managed to avoid uh, to hold out against the pole Uh, you have a feeling that might have been bad Um, in frustration uh, it is then going to turn back towards the room now able to kind of see everyone Uh, you were spread out though so it unfortunately does not get to use all of its magical blast, um, uh, fire blast rather, as it turns towards Reeves and Walsh and lets loose a cone, a torrent of flame from its head. Uh, mm. I need for all of you, or I need for uh, Falstaff, Walsh, and Reeves to make dexterity saving throws, please. DC is still 15. I'm going to use my... Inspiration from DM Dave. Um, Told you they would need it. (laughs) Yeah. I got 24. Hey, 24 is a big success. I I will also use my inspiration (laughs) from DM Dave. Uh, Not paying off for me tonight. None of these are paying off for me. I got a 10. You still got one more inspiration. I think I've used them both. I think I had poetry and then the one that Dave got us. And I think that's it for me. Okay. Um, you can fresh out. Uh, and then for Falstaff. Falstaff, I, well, we'll see. Falstaff got a 16. Walsh got a 10. All right. So Reeves and Falstaff succeed. So they only take <laughs> six points of fire damage. Uh, Walsh takes 13 points of fire damage and is on fire. Yikes. 13, you said? 13 points of fire damage, and literally, like, the his, his coat is starting to catch fire. Uh, and uh, basically, just so you know, at the top of your turn, you're going to take some more fire damage unless you use your action, uh, until you use an action to put it out. Okay. Uh, but okay. Falstaff and Reeves succeeded, so they do not have... Or they are not on fire. Uh, and that means that it's Walsh's turn. So I need to roll that fire damage. So you take an additional four points of fire damage. And it is your turn, Walsh. We okay. did just get um, inspiration again. 
Oh, oh uh, yes. Fantastic. Nice. One red yeah. 70. Thank you so much. Much appreciated. Bits. Very <laughs> much appreciated. Uh, very much Ooh. appreciated. I will spend my action to not be on fire anymore. So Walsh is kind of going to dance around with that same big coat and kind of just like spin it around, try to pat the flames out as much as he can. Um, yeah. Yeah, you, but you as, pat them as, out. Um, it's it's you've been on fire before from your stuff you do in your workshop. You're used to the to, yeah. to the dance, uh, and uh, and DM Dave giving one red uh, a gift sub. Thank you so much, Dave. Uh, much appreciated, of course. Um, what else would you like to do, Walsh? Because you still have your bonus action. I do, and so Falstaff is going to try to shoot this thing again. Did not Go enjoy that experience. <laughs> So one more blast from the force cannon. 17. That hits. Hey. All right. And so that is going to be 12 points of force damage. Nice. Uh, just so you guys know, it is looking rough. Uh, it now regards um, Falstaff as a fairly big threat. Good. Falstaff has so many hit points left. <laughs> <laughs> you don't even know. Uh, is that your turn? That's all I got. Yep. Ada, you are up, madam. Okay. First thing she'd like to do is look around the room and see if there are any exits uh, that we have not, you the know, looked at yet. The entrance that you came through and then further down the corridor, there is a, a few chambers that kind of go off to the, to the center and the two sides. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Okay. Don't love that. Uh, how far away is everybody from this at this point? Is anyone like super close? I, so I would say that all of you are probably now about 20 feet away from it, um, just because of it mm -hmm. having to move kind of closer to the rest of you. And it's you guys are all kind of like surrounding it, uh, which is why it couldn't get all of you in its cone. Um, yeah. And it's and it's like in the center of all of you, basically. Okay, okay. So in that case, I am just going to uh, throw some spike growth underneath this thing. Um, so it will... Give me an Arcana check. Oh, no. 25. Is that a dumb idea? Yeah, it's a dumb idea. You you are fairly certain the creature Great. that you are seeing now is one of... is a... what... Um, what Ada has read about in her books and, you know many many tomes of all things arcane uh little bones with a sub thank you hey. so much oh when one red gifted that's amazing thank you one red um you ada is fairly certain that this thing is what is referred to as a hybrid elemental which is a magical creation that th has long been sought for how to create um that is a common it's it's a constructed so an arcanist created this thing out of mm -hmm. several different elemental creatures that have all kind of been bound together the fact that it's not like rage rampaging right now probably surprises ada um but ada Great. would also know that it is immune to all things that would hinder its movement from magic and okay. she might be able to get a little bit of damage but it's not going to be much perfect Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ada, for having more knowledge than I do. Um, okay, well, in that case, I am going to just uh, throw some <laughs> Eldritch Blasts at it, uh, just because um, you know, 16 misses, right? 16 that... just hits. Hell yes. That is exactly its AC. <laughs> All right, well, that's 12 points of damage for the first blast. And then the nice. second blast is a 23 to hit. That also and hits. And that'll be an additional 10 damage for the second blast. And then um, Ada would like to, still maintaining at least 20 feet distance from this thing, maybe like skirt around so she's a little bit closer to the, you know, Mm -hmm. hallway with doors and stuff and gotcha. then um as she's as she's like you know running her way over there um she'll just say are we fighting should we run what are we doing and then that'll be the end of the turn 
I will say that in this instance, Reeves kind of gets the sense that you guys are doing some pretty serious hits on this thing. Uh, okay. And if you can keep this up, it's it's not going to last too much longer. Um, it is Reeves' turn, in fact. If you Does can avoid response, dying, <laughs> yeah. If you can avoid dying, we'll be fine. Uh, just a few nice hits from full staff, and we'll be fine. Um, you can. We could also run if you really want, uh, but I'm not. I'm gonna Zephyr strike again. I'm gonna run up. Uh, it gives me an extra thirty feet of movement, so I can get to wherever it is. Yeah, and, you had more uh, than enough already. So, and I think it gives me advantage on attack again, so I'll take it. So that is twenty-four to hit. Yeah. Uh, so that's uh, seven slashing. Then on sneak attack, I get a d6. Just so you know, Dave gave you an advantage, right? Yeah. By the way, Reeves. Oh, another one? Yeah. yeah. Oh, dang. Okay. Racking him up. Dave, making sure you guys get through this encounter. Uh, yeah, I need to. I need to survive this. I get a d4 from favored foe as well, which I've been forgetting. Uh, that's only an extra one of the regular slashing damage. And then Zephyr Strike is another one uh, for... So a total, of a total of 10? Yeah, I think so. All right. Uh, it's looking pretty fucking hurt at this point. Uh, do you have another attack? Me? Yeah, no, I don't have another one I can do, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, it's it's looking pretty rough as as Reeves has gone charging back into the fray, uh, feeling that aura of elemental energies once again uh, hit his uh, hit his flesh. Uh, Val, you are up. Hit it this time, please. Um, hearing Ada suggest running away, Val wants nothing more than to absolutely just run. Um, you know, if she was in this room by herself, she would have definitely just tried to sneak past this thing and not engage it with it. But I mean, Val's she's probably playing... pretty sure that it wouldn't have known that Val was here. It's somebody else had to have set it off. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> and she's feeling a little bit of responsibility for the group and she hates it. And she'll take her bow out and she'll aim and she'll fire. All right. Are you doing your steady aim again? Yeah. Go for All it. Right. Yeah, totally. Do it. Oh, it's an 11. <laughs> an 11, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, you do have an advantage. Yeah, let's do it. 23. Hey, 23 hits. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Dave, um, coming in clutch once again. Whoa. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate MVP, it. MVP, Dave. Absolutely. <laughs> most Val Ubal player. <gasps> Stop <laughs> it. 8 plus 15. So nice. 23 points of damage. Oh, How fuck. do you want to do this, Val? Yeah! <laughs> Damn. <laughs> so Val feels that responsibility starting to feel like that it's nice to go dungeon diving with other people instead of by herself um, and feels maybe she should start stop running away from fights and problems and aims and sh fires an arrow. As the arrow. Let, okay, sorry, please go, go ahead. ahead. No, no, I want you to go ahead. Okay. Uh, <laughs> as the arrow flies through the air, uh, the the sound of the bowstring causes it to turn its head back towards uh, and the arrow flies and pierces the, the center aura of arcane energy uh, at where its face ostensibly is even though it's featureless uh, and as it punches through you guys all see its head kind of implode for a second uh, but then as you're relishing this moment of it starting to like crumble and fall apart a burst of elemental energies erupts from it. Um, and all of you still being within 20 feet of it, unfortunately need to make <laughs> dexterity saving throws. Perfect. Cool, 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 cool. Good thing I used that metal that gives me strength advantage. I am gonna use my Dave advantage. <laughs> uh, me too. Yeah, also. Oh, wow. <sighs> That's uh... not much better. Yeah, I went from a four to a thirteen. So, 
The DC yeah, is 15, maybe. guys. That's I got a five. 10. Did I anyone got succeed? I got 15. I, well, she succeeded on the reroll. Uh, okay. Paul Staff got a 10. Okay. Oh, no. All right. Uh, okay. Let's see. That is going to be... Um, so in a swirl of electricity and fire uh, and cold... Uh, this burst of energy just erupts from this thing's body. Uh, anyone that failed the save takes 16 points of damage of various types. Anyone that succeeded takes only eight. Okay. But this thing does crumble to nothing. Uh, fragments of it skitter across the, the ground from the explosion. You guys can all see arcs of elemental energies kind of wafting through the fragments of its body. Uh, did anyone go down from that final blast? Nope. Falstaff did. No, um, no. It's okay. It's okay. Falstaff is in um, arcane cannon mode, which means that he has lower stats, but way more hit points. So um, because he's an arcane cannon, functionally, I think what happens is he gets blown back against the wall. The clamps and the things that were holding him in place are not strong enough, and it kind of um, shatters some of the components. The cannon part of him kind of like falls out some of the extra pieces that cover his body slide off as well and it's just he's kind of left a little less bulky and a little more like monkey like in his frame i think so like he's still up and kind of limping around but the arcane cannon is out of commission no no uh Bloody. so yeah as you guys kind of Im feel this impact of elemental energies and are looking around and see fall staff like healing off of the side wall uh, with chunks of its body uh, falling away from it, uh, feeling the stress of the, the fight that just happened. We're going to take a break. Yeah. We will be back uh, in five minutes, guys. I promise as close to five minutes as uh, we can possibly make it. And uh, yeah, we'll see you guys soon. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Monday Night Mayhem, uh, where our intrepid group of adventurers has just managed to uh, finish off, uh, in a way, um, uh, an elemental creature that uh, had attacked them as they had entered this ruined temple or ruined tower um, many, many, many feet below the surface uh, of the deserts of Aubrath. Um, wounded from the encounter, everyone starts to kind of pick themselves up off of the ground, uh, dust themselves off, as it were. Some of your, some of you have hair kind of standing on end. Some of you have like frost across the side of your face or scorch marks uh, from the elemental energies that had kind of assaulted all of you there at the end. Um, in this moment, though. I would actually like to take an opportunity for Val, who in the fray began to kind of have a little bit of a, a crisis moment, as it were, uh, until getting the final blow. Uh, and many, many memories start rolling back into, um, into Val's mind. So let's take this back, actually maybe just a few weeks ago as Val is on her way to 
the um, Bay 12, as it was called, where the Dune Raker was awaiting her and ostensibly the rest of her adventuring troop that was supposed to take her into the, or that she was supposed to take into these supposed ruins in search of some treasures of some kind and ostensibly to protect some other person, something like that. Not entirely sure about all of those details. As Val is walking that direction, she sees a familiar face up ahead, leaning up against a wall, plainly staring at Val as she is making her way down the street. She spots Hadric, gentleman that she is often loath to see. What does she do? She continues walking, doesn't make eye contact with them. As he's, she's getting closer to, to him, she'll kind of take a breath and say, I, I don't have the energy to pretend to like you today and we'll continue walking. As she starts to continue walking past Hadric, he kind of chuckles to himself and steps blatantly in front of her path to stop her and says, now, now, Val, you know, it's not quite so easy to get away from the organization, don't you? The people who work for you must be saints. Oh, very much not, I assure you. They are not saints in any way. You know, you've worked for us. We're having to deal with you every day. It's a lot of work. Indeed. I make sure that the people working for me come through when needed. And here I am to make sure that you, Val, come through when needed. And? Well, I think you know that uh, there's a payment coming due quite soon. I'm working on it. I know. Word on the street is that you managed to get yourself unarrested thanks to a particular encounter with a gentleman from the Spires. Yeah, it's, uh, it's the new job. Mm. And um, this new job uh, ostensibly leads somewhere in the deserts that you will um, be delving into for lost treasures and such. That's what I do. Is there a point to this story? Can I please go? No, Val. You can't go. And you know damn well that you can't go. You see, when a debt gets bought, there comes an additional price that goes along with it. And I'm here to allay that price to you. You see, we know that this is a Spire-sponsored incursion. We know that this is supposedly supposed to be on the up and up. And we also know that you are going with a representative of the Spires. And I'm here to tell you that whatever that person wants, they can't have. What are you asking me to do? I think you know quite well what it means to owe a debt this large, don't you? That it's not just you that carries that debt, that if you don't come through, we might have to pay a visit to Grandma as she's sipping her mimosas. What do you need me to do? This individual Wait. from the Spire is going in to collect something. We would like you to collect it instead. 
and bring it to the Og. And then what? We're done? We're finished? Well, that's going to depend on whether or not you succeed. But yeah, I think so. Until, that is, you need to maybe get some coin once again. All right. It's fine. I'll get it to you. You seem disheartened, Val. I don't like people that work for me to be disheartened. It's kind of hard not to feel this way when I'm in proximity to, like, the worst person I've ever met. Why, thank you. Considering the people that you uh, have met in your life and the circles that you've walked in, that's a mighty fine compliment. Yeah, I know a lot of shitty people, absolutely. But if I really wanted to hear an asshole talk for this long, I would have just farted and left. <laughs> Oh, Val, I do love your sense of humor. Just remember, Grandma isn't the only one that likes mimosas. Now you be on your way and come through for us this time, won't you? You bet. And I'll walk away. <laughs> As Val walks away, feeling this threat upon her, we return back to the current situation, everyone picking themselves up off of the ground. Val, feeling at least somewhat accomplished, she felled this creature, sees uh, Ada off to the side, not looking too well herself, maybe um, a bit more worse for wear than she's ever been, <laughs> or maybe only a handful of times anyway. How does Val feel? Val is absolutely winded. Um, she's very bloodied. Pick herself up, walk over to Be to Ada. <laughs> kind of, are you on is Ada on the ground? Is she? How's Ada looking? Well, uh, Ada is sitting in a way that you've never seen her sit before. Um, just sort of like heavy on the ground, legs sort of splayed. Her hair is like. And she's, like, just moving her glasses up. Um, I felt better. But I think I'm okay. How are you? You you did some amazing things. I, I'm i very impressed. Thank you. Val will extend a hand to help Ada up. Oh, thank you. I, you know, I don't normally, when I do this, fight all these monsters i am no combat strategist i panicked a lot honestly it was a lot of luck i mean it seems like you worked through it though if you're afraid of something i mean all you can do is just try to get over it the best way you can some people ignore a situation and some um you know, dive in head first. And it seems like that's what you did today. You don't know how badly I wanted to ignore the situation. But you didn't. That counts. It's all Ree's fault. <laughs> that was a, that was a great shot, Val. I was, I was just about to do it myself, but uh, good job. Thank you, Walsh. I appreciate that. Uh, good news, everybody. Falstaff is going to be fine. Oh, thank took goodness. A, took a little, got a little banged up, but I can fix him. Just need a little time. Okay. Oh, I know we just rested. Maybe we need to take another nap. <laughs> Reconvene. Uh, how, how's everyone feeling? I know you're looking oh. rough. Yep. I felt better, but uh, it could be worse. I mean, I, I have um, some potions that I was given for, for healing. Um, just, just a couple if we felt like we needed to keep going now, but, um, Val, what do you think? I mean, I feel like if I was hit four more times, I'd pass out. That's fair. Um, 
should we just settle down for for a little bit then? Well, just take a take a short moment. It could take a few minutes maybe, but we've only been up and moving around for <laughs> under an hour or so. It's been a busy morning. I'd like to take out my geo to see if it's still shifting like like crazy or if it's kind of settled. That's a that's a good point. So as you pull out the geode and activate it, you find that it is no longer having that same effect that had been beleaguering it the previous night. Um, her proficiency in Arcana kind of tells her that given what she saw of the doors is probably some kind of just magic ward that takes place on the outside of this structure, whatever it is. Um, and it seems to be working fine now. Like to find like the closest kind of recessed cave or something where it's just like a, a small cave where we could kind of set up a, a rustic spot so we're not out in the open. Yeah, totally. So as the geode takes a minute and just like forms this illusory image of the the layout of the space around you, um, you're able to know that about another, you know, 30-ish feet down the the passageway that you guys are in, in this, this entryway, that is, uh, it kind of splits off in three directions. One of them just only goes about another 15 feet before it's complete and total cave-in and is completely irrelevant and useless as far as you can tell. Um, it, you don't have the, the resources to be able to get past the rubble, to say the least. Um, the central one looks like it opens or the, it goes down further and just at the edge of the range of the, the geode, you can see that there is a, a stairwell leading down. And then there's another passageway just off uh, in the opposite direction from the one that had all of the rubble that um, goes down for probably another 20, maybe 25 feet, uh, and then opens up into a chamber of some kind. It's hard to make out what the chamber would be used for from the map um, because there's a fair bit of rubble and, you know, debris and such. Uh, Miss Koruma, um, your little compass. Oh, yes. how accurate is it? I mean, I've only recently started using it, um, but it, it, it seems to have gotten us this far. Okay. As you pull out the compass, oh, no. it's it's spinning, like mm. extremely fast. I mean, this is good news, I suppose. I'll take your word for it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, well, cave in. It it limits our options. That's good. What, oh. uh, Val or or Ada, Miss Kuruma, you either of you know? Which one we should take? I mean, this is spinning in circles, so I, as far as it's concerned, we're here. Um, uh, Val, does your map sort of give any other? I mean, there's a, a small cave. We can rest in there real quick. And then there's this path that goes, it looks like it goes to some kind of corridor. It goes on. And it stops. I can't tell what it's for. Why didn't you ask me? Maybe I have an opinion. I mean, can you see? <sighs> it's sure. very dark down here. I put my drops in. I can see. <laughs> well, do you have an opinion? Not particularly, but it's nice to be asked. Okay, I'll remember that. Full staff, do you have an opinion? <laughs> no, you can be very <laughs> shakily and like glitch. Like glitchily <laughs> shakes his head. <laughs> Perfect. Well, Val, I, I mean, I, I trust your judgment as far as um, where you think looks the safest, um, and so, yours too, Walsh and and Reeves. You're all very uh, smart <laughs> and capable, and I trust you all implicitly. Um, so you all can decide, and I'll just over here trying to fix my hair just a little bit let's go into the cave-in and take a breather check how fall staff's doing patch him up patch myself up and then continue on okay sounds like a plan rest 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 
<laughs> you guys are all able to take a short rest uh, and spend any hit dice, get back all of those things. Uh, you proceed, I'll just take over a little bit here narratively. So you proceed down that small caved in passageway. Um, it's, it's very comfortable from the perspective of easily defensible. Um, but it doesn't offer you many exits. So Reeves, perhaps more than anyone else, is a little bit on edge from, you know, the potential of another elemental monster coming up and, and fighting all of you. But thankfully, no such beast uh, or being, rather, arises from the ground to to assault you. Um, during that time, Walsh's eye drops wear out. Um, but as Walsh's eye drops uh lose their efficacy uh, and he sits there and rubs his burning eyes and he's blinking and uh, he just you know can't stand the thought of putting in uh, another set of drops you guys are now in close enough proximity that you can see the central corridor and for some reason Walsh and not the rest of you who are using your dark vision to be able to see Walsh can now see what appears to be some kind of a magical light coming from that central corridor. Well, well, that is convenient. I'm almost out of drops. How is that convenient? Well, now I don't need to use them. There's light. Where? Down the central corridor. Right, right there. Are you, are you turned around? No. No, oh, you don't see it. No, I don't see anything. At no. least Valriel is astute enough to know that she could shift <laughs> her dark vision to her normal vision, like, and and look if she wanted to. I would say Val's been in these types of places and situations enough to at least recognize that there is truth in 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 what Walsh is saying is not completely out of left field. I gaslight Walsh. That <laughs> oh no! <laughs> Come on, it's just mean. That's why. Uh <laughs> no. What friends do? No, no, it really isn't. <laughs> All right, no, I get it. It's a good. That's a good joke. I understand. You all have dark vision. I don't have dark vision, but there's light up ahead. I can promise you that. Yeah, he's right. Oh, okay. Well, uh, is it good light? If if, 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 be, if if you shift your neutral. if if Ada shifts her dark vision to, back to her normal vision, down. yeah, uh, and as oh. she shifts, she can see the magical light, and she would recognize it instantly as the kind of light that is produced from Arcana. The fact that it is also shielded from dark vision implies to her that it is a very rare uh, and exotic spell working of some kind. Oh, this is exciting. Okay. Um, definitely magical. Uh, I, I mean, I personally would like to move closer to it, but I mean, you, you all can. When I had checked my geo, did I see any traps? Because it highlights traps and... Um... Right, it did, you did not see any traps. Thank you for reminding me. I meant to say that there was no traps that you could discern. Nice. It looks pretty safe. Uh, no traps. Reeves, you want to lead the way again? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, how much time do I have left on my medal? Am I out now? It's, it's out, an hour. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. I'll walk forward. Um, I have blind sight within 10 feet. If I uh, switch my lenses to blind sight, uh, can I see the light or is no. it not there? No. Okay. So you guys are all proceeding then down the central corridor? Mm -hmm. As you make your way, uh, oh, fantasy animal vegan coming in with three advantages Ooh. for Will and six for me. Oh, no. Oh, hey. Okay. I, mean, oh, I was going to say, Will, I hope they didn't watch your uh, Pokemon game where you had to cook up some Oddish and stuff. So <laughs> this, this is slander. This is this is slander. That didn't happen. I didn't do that. 
<laughs> oh my God. It was a fever dream. Okay. <laughs> thank, you, thank you, Fantasy Animal Vegan. That's amazing. Love you. Uh, we will we will definitely be making notes of those. Um, oh. Yes. Oh, you no. proceed your way down this central corridor. Um, as you're proceeding down, it goes a, a decent distance before um, the uh, the passageway starts to go downward, as the geode had indicated. And reeves before any of the rest of you you can feel a rumbling in the ground and at first you think "Uh oh here comes another elemental but then you notice reeves not the rest of you notices a difference in the rumbling pretty much as soon as the rest of you start to feel it reeves can feel this almost tectonic shift of the ground uh, as if the area that you're in is relatively unstable Oh. So just something to be mindful of that causes the walls to kind of shake just a little bit. Some dust and, you know, debris falls from the ceiling and the walls and pelts you guys some. But it does stop just like a few seconds later. As you begin to proceed your way down a little bit more concern uh, in your mind, you make your way to the end of the corridor and Ada sees probably the most familiar sight that she has seen thus far. She sees what appears to be an ancient version of the glass steel elevators that exist in the spires. Oh, wow. Um, okay, so it's ancient looking. Does, does it, um, without getting too close and possibly, I don't know, causing a cave-in, uh, does it look like it would be operational? Is it like... It's floating perfectly in the space as if it is 100% operational. I mean, you could do a detect magic if you want to try to oh, learn yeah. more. I can do that at will. Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you cast detect magic. Give me an arcana yeah. shot, please. Okay. Nope. <laughs> it's a nine. And the magic is still, I mean, detect magic gives you a baseline of things. So even yeah, though you yeah. rolled a nine, uh, the magic is still quite strong. Um, it's definitely weakened from mm. perhaps what it was once, um, but it is strong enough now at the very least. Um, those of you that have a passive perception of around 14 or better uh, are able to notice that even though Walsh and Reeves are not familiar with this floating glass steel discus that sits uh, in the, the passageway in front of them, um, Val probably recognizes it too once Ada starts to kind of point it out its benefits and function. You can see that there is, the passageway does indeed extend down. It's basically a hole, almost as if it is drilled out from the ground itself that extends down below the edges, uh, or far, far down below the edges of this platform and rises too far up above for you to ascertain. This is fairly incredible. Um... Did they have this? Fairly then? incredible. Okay. <laughs> um... I, I, I mean, I suppose they did, because uh, it, it exists, but this is very curious. Um, huh. Walsh sees a console on the far side of the platform that catches his eye as having crystals and glass embedded in various parts of its structure that he fairly astutely would recognize as the kind of thing that would be controlling for the platform. Ada doesn't recognize that because the modern ones don't require that. They operate on thought. This one apparently does not. Uh, I've seen something like this before. Hold on. And I will go examine the panel and see if I can figure out exactly how the controls work. Uh, yeah, it's very basic from Walsh's perspective. He has worked with, I mean, the Dune Raker is way more advanced than elevator controls, right? Like you don't even need to roll. You very, very quickly get an assertion of which crystals cause the platform to go down, which ones control its speed. Uh, there appears to be one that he's not entirely sure of the function, but he thinks it might have something to do with like safety. Um, as uh, the, the the function of it appears to like cause the, the, the slight variation of stepping onto the platform to be more rigid. 
right? Like, like an almost like not an emergency lock, um, like the the brake uh, the braking system uh, in modern cars for yeah yeah I forget what that's called. Um, it's the anti lock brake system. Yeah, anti lock. It's like an anti lock brake system for an elevator. <laughs> Got it. Makes sense. Uh yeah. No, it, it's pretty straightforward. I I can operate it. I mean that's that's great. Uh, do do we go down? I just push the buttons. You tell me where to go. The older stuff's probably down. If that's what we're looking for. Val, is that typically the case? Just keep going down, and you find Ty what you need. Typically, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think we want to go further down. Does somebody have to stay up here to operate it uh the panel set on the platform itself right yep okay yeah nice so it'll travel with us okay um ada will reach around and, and uh sort of like pat her pockets and grab the the compass again and just look at it is it still spinning um yes it is still spinning but it has slowed and it, okay. With her investigation, what it is, I would say that Ada is able to ascertain that it is not able to point down. And so she kind mm -hmm. of tilts it in her hand because it's a magical compass. It's not like yeah. floating in water, as it were, or anything like that. So it can operate uh, in a sideward position. And as she does that, it is indeed pointing straight down. Oh, this is fantastic. Okay. Uh down it looks like it is. um and she'll go to put it back in her pocket and feel and realize oh walsh i have these glasses um they're prism glasses that allow you to have dark vision i did not remember that i had these i got them as a gift and i don't particularly need them but perhaps they could help you see in in the dark now that we're all right, well, you know, here. In first this. of all, I don't need dark vision. No, I know, I but just it, it'd just be helpful. It. Your expertise would just be elevated by, um, you know, greater, greater vision. So for what it's worth, as I had previously described, there is a magical ambient light in this space. Right. I just figure like for the rest of this time, we've been going through this whole thing. He's doing the, you know, terrible eye drops. And I've, I've just now realized that I have these uh, mm -hmm. that we could use. I will accept them, and I will say thank you. You're welcome. They also can let you see um, a bunch of color in dim conditions. So you can perceive color for the first 15 feet that you see in darkness instead of shades of gray. So for okay, whatever that's all right. Well, listen, I don't uh, know what you so think that's you know only about true humans. If you have dark vision. <laughs> oh. Okay. Okay. So these do not actually grant dark vision. Son of a bitch. They okay. improve your existing dark vision. So so Reeves goes to put them on and they don't do a fucking thing for him. Yeah, no, these are broken, first of all. And second of all, I don't know what you think you know about humans, but we can see color. Uh, <laughs> I apologize for insulting you. That yeah, humans not. just can't go look up. That's what I've heard. I <laughs> will, will reach into her back and pull out a torch and be like, hey, I realize I have this torch. <laughs> you know what? Everything is, everything's fine. Why don't we just go down? <laughs> just reach, okay. touch the button. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll accidentally fall on the button. Yeah. <laughs> Oops. Okay. You guys, you guys start descending down lower into the ground. Um, and the first thing that any of you notice is that the the corridor that's carved out of this stone uh, or out of the earth is all like it's rough because of age. But otherwise, it is perfectly crafted stonework. Right. There is no semblance of the the of like the earth dig digging into it from the tectonic shifts and things. It is perfectly well structured, if not just very, very, very old. And so as you descend down and down and down, you go a good hundred feet 
and nothing changes. There's no shift in any of the walls. There's no exit platform, anything. And then you go another hundred feet and another hundred feet and another hundred feet. I need oh, for no. all of you to make constitution saving throws, please. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm gonna use God. one of those three advantages that I got. <laughs> oh, that's a 21 for me. Did nice. I have two advantages earlier or just the one? Uh, you should still have one left. Yeah. yeah, you should still okay. have one left. I will definitely use that because it did not feel good. Oh, um, shit. That is a dirty 20 on Reeves. Uh, for what oh, it's worth, Falstaff does not need to make this safe. Cool. Because he that is, is not an organic creature. I got a 6. True. Oh, I got a 21 after I rerolled. All right, so Val is unfortunately the only one that failed this save. Um, Val is starting to, all of you are feeling it, but the rest of you are able to kind of like hold it off and not be too encumbered by it. Val is starting to feel the pressure of being so far deep underground. She uh, effectively has disadvantage on all ability checks at the moment because she is so far deep underground. This is the deepest that Val has ever been in any of her dives into any ruins. Um, and it's definitely having an effect on her as her vision starts to close in a little bit. Um, all of you are able to see very clearly that Val is suffering a little bit from this, that she's not able to, to fight it off as strongly as the rest of you. Should we stop? Give her time to acclimate? I mean, I don't know if I know that word. <laughs> uh, Val, do you need here? Um, and Ada will go stand next to her and just sort of like put her arm out. Just hold on, and just breathe slowly. She'll reach out and grab it, but she's kind of disassociating from her body a little bit. God. Do you want me to stop it? I can stop it. Maybe just for a moment. We'll hit the stop button. <laughs> Yeah, you're able to stop it, no problem. Um, as you stop it, I need for all of you, except for Val, because I think Val is probably a little bit too distracted in this case, to either make Arcana checks or Investigation checks, whichever you would prefer. Eighteen for Walsh. Investigation. Eighteen Investigation. Nine Investigation. That's a three, or, I'm sorry, thirteen. My goodness, I have a plus nine, and that's what I got. <laughs> All right. Um, so as Walsh stops the platform and everybody is kind of taking, uh, you know, paying attention to Val and, you know, looking around a bit, uh, feeling the effects of this, um, Walsh, thankfully, the magical luminescence of this place still strong as it was before, providing dim light, uh, if not necessarily bright light, allows Walsh to kind of just take a moment and look around. As he's looking around, he sees a distinct ripple of what is obviously has to be magical energy of some kind in the wall that is surrounding them. It just kind of washes over it as if like a wave rippled around him. And then it's gone, or it kind of sticks around. Like... And then it's gone. And okay. if you wait, if you if you wait long enough, it does come back. But okay. Um. Yeah. Look, everything is um. Everything's gonna be fine, Val. Uh. Maybe could uh it uh Reeves could we could I sidebar. <laughs> yeah. Everything's fine, Val. Don't worry. Oh, that doesn't sound like everything's fine. <laughs> uh, no, I, well, uh, hard to say. Uh, we are being uh, bombarded with waves of magical energy periodically. Okay. Not sure what they're doing, but they're just kind of like washing over us and then dissipating. And then another one washes over us. If uh, If Ada throws up the detect magic 
again? Is it just yeah. like... I need you to make an intelligence saving throw. Okay. 19. Okay. As soon as you cast the detect magic, you can see that all of the walls around you are illusion. And that everything behind the wall is pure open space with occasional like pillars of stone just like it's like almost like a, a honeycomb of caverns on surrounding you in too far distant for you to even perceive it is not an enclosed in wall that's just an illusion that you have now perfectly pierced not to alarm anyone further um the magic in the walls they're not walls um we are floating in the abyss i guess one could say um and uh i i don't want to go down any further if we could avoid it that sounds like maybe a bad idea um yeah and she like shifts herself as close to like the middle of this platform as possible uh, well, yeah. I so mean, it stopped. <clears throat> Walsh, give me a. Um, we'll call this an artificer check using intelligence or wisdom, whichever is higher, and your proficiency bonus because you're obviously a very proficient artificer. Fair enough. And uh, fifteen. Fifteen. You were kind of curious why there was a X and Y axis control mechanism. It didn't make sense at first and you just kind of ignored it. You thought maybe it was just dead controls that didn't matter for this platform and maybe some other platform used it and this was just kind of standard installation. And now you get it. This platform flies. It doesn't just go up and down. Yeah, no, okay. That actually makes a lot of sense. Um, so, yeah, we're not... We're flying. Uh, and so I can make it go, you know, left, right, up, down, all of the normal directions. Okay. Um, okay, and Ada just sits down <laughs> on this platform. Okay. Um, uh, not sure where anything is, but we can do that. I can maybe point you in the, the right direction. I could sort of see through these illusory walls. Um, what would we be looking for? Just, just. Once again, you are the only one with any information about uh, this place. I know. I, I'm just feeling slightly nauseous. Um, okay. Okay, uh, well, I will look around <laughs> and see if I can see anything, like, on our x-axis here, um, immediately, and then sort of also, like, look up and down, mostly up, down is the last resort, to see if there's any indication of, uh, where we should move. Um being the nice GM that I am and knowing how much time we have left in tonight's session, I would suggest that Ada is astute enough to pull out her compass. She pulls out her compass that she has and hasn't forgotten about. As soon as Ada pulls out her compass, she can actually see that you have indeed gone too far down and up and with a little bit of tilting in her hand up and like... 37 degrees via the uh, upper left arc, um, you're able to know that that is the direction that you need to go. You can't see anything because you can't see very far in this space. Mm -hmm. Like you can't see clearly enough beyond a few hundred feet just because of every the situation. But you know a direction now. Okay. Uh, Walsh, if you could please guide us in, in that general direction, that direction, whatever. Mm -hmm. Um I think now, now that we've got the compass out, we can we can get there. Um, yep. Walsh will take the controls and start yep. trying to steer in the direction that the, the compass is pointing. And as he does, so he'll say, "Val, uh, good news. 
Uh, we're not in a bottomless mine shaft. We are, in fact, floating in an empty void. So, um, good news for you. As soon as Walsh moves the, the platform into the wall that he knows is illusory, he still cringes at the idea it's about to hit. As soon as he dips into it, he is able to also perceive the illusion itself. And you guys all just shift the platform through the illusory wall and begin navigating this subterranean massive complex of corridors uh, and open passages that, you know, just mind boggling to all of you. As soon as you get another like hundred feet or so up, Valriel starts to feel better. The pressure upon her lessens, uh, and she's no longer debilitated like she was. Um, as as she starts to get her wits about her, I think Val, more than perhaps any of the rest of you, sees this vast open space of almost nothingness. And for probably one of the fewest times in her life, she feels complete and utter calm in the silence of it. There is no distraction here. There's no presence that she has to look out over her shoulder. This is certainly not a place that anyone had ever, would ever come to to harm her. She feels a sense of calm about it. The rest of you, on the other hand, perhaps not quite as calm as Walsh is having to deftly navigate these ginormous pillars of stone and earth uh, that are holding up this structure, which is obviously also magical in some capacity. Ada is just mind blown at the sheer arcane power that would be required for any of this. And I think Reeves in this instance is probably just like contemplating what could live down here, right? He's hunted so many abominations and creatures from all segments of the world. And this just blows his mind as, as to what would be down in this space. Hey, thank you Prometheus for the raid. Welcome, welcome. You are just uh, about to catch our uh, adventuring group as they are making their way through this void of subterranean space on a magical flying platform. Um, as you are going through, do any of you have anything in particular that you would like to do as you're basically just following the compass? And it is navigating you, like it's pivoting as you pivot and giving you direction. Um, I think Walsh is just being, is just enjoying being behind, like, the controls of something again. That's where he's and, most comfortable. And this thing's freaking flying. Yeah. That's a new one. I, I think Ada's just amazed, like you said, at, at this. I mean, it, it feels like new technology to her, but it is clearly not new, and that's sort of doing some things <laughs> to her. Um, so I think she's a little bit lost in uh, trying to figure all of that out. Reeves? I think Reeves is just kind of like, I, I, I think he might be getting a little bit motion sick now that it's moving in all sorts of extra other ways. And so he's just probably like laying down, uh, closing his eyes, trying to like, uh, keep his mind away from his blind sight so that he doesn't feel himself moving in the space. Um, I just, he just, he, this is not the part he signed up for, or at least he didn't know he was signing up for. There's one in every party. <laughs> and then Val. Val is, I imagine, sitting down. Uh, she was hunched over, feeling the pressure kind of dry heaving a bit, but now is relishing the after feeling all that pressure the absence of it and then is thinking about what it would be like to have a fresh start like walsh has had nice as you guys are floating through this vast void of subterranean space uh and encounter experience and 
in so many different ways, you begin to see a light up ahead, a plainly clear, perfectly crystalline blue light. And that's where the arrow is pointing from the compass. All of you, despite any lack of expertise or proficiency in Arcana, are able to immediately recognize something that would be so markedly arcane and uh, filled with magic. As you approach, uh, Walsh begins to slow the platform that is guiding you, and you can feel the inertia of it. Um, I think Ada and maybe even Val are starting to recognize that despite how strong this magic is, it's definitely not what it used to be, because any of these platforms uh, that you use now, you never feel the inertia. Magic just prevents that. And the fact that you're starting to feel that inertia uh, in this maybe worries the two of you ever so slightly as Walsh slows. The magic light itself seems to be coming from some kind of a platform just floating in the nothingness. As you rise up to face the platform, you now stand within just a few steps of it, being able to step onto the platform. Nothing but light is all you see at the center of it. Maybe those of you that have the highest of pers passive perceptions are able to see slight fragments of what appears to be crystalline structure from within the light. Okay. We had luck with this platform. Statistically speaking, what do we think the odds are of this next platform uh, not killing us? Not zero, but... Uh-huh, uh-huh. Not great. Okay. Um, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, <laughs> she, like, steadies herself and, and looks at it. Um, is... I feel like I want to make some kind of check for this thing. Like, it, it, can I, yeah. from it from a distance, without getting it, sure. uh, like, without stepping yeah, I mean, onto it, can I like, investigate? Magic. Yeah, that's, yeah. I mean, yeah, I can... you can absolutely just open your senses to the detect magic and do an arcana check if you wish. I would love that. I would not love that. Uh, that's an eight. <laughs> Man, eight is good at this. Why is she rolling so bad? Because, you know, she's afraid of heights and she's a little nauseous right now. Thank you. <laughs> That's totally fair. Uh, yeah. <laughs> thankfully, the detect magic does give you a little bit. Um, sure. uh, this is <clears throat> every school of magic. Like she can see sigils floating in the light that are invisible without detect magic. But she can see sigils floating in the light of every school Every spell that she's ever looked at in a book or a scroll, um, ever seen in written form, she sees runes from all of those spells floating within the aura of light. Okay. To be clear, Is... not as like active they're about to be cast upon you. Right, right. I, I was just going to say, like, is um, is her feeling about this like positive then like a good understanding or i there is no threat i will tell you that i would i would not okay. deign to to tell you positive or negative but sure, i can tell sure. you that there is no obvious threat okay um i'll sort of relay to the group what i've seen and um should should we go on to the next platform should we, i try to touch it I feel I'll, like... I'll jump across. I'll <laughs> jump over to the next platform. Uh, Wait a second. Uh, no, nobody look at me for a second. Just, just don't look at me for like one second. I already then... wasn't looking at you. <laughs> but... but now. And she'll, like, and she'll rummage through her bag and she'll pull out the, these glasses. And they're the thickest glasses you've ever seen in your life. And when she puts them on, her eyes get huge. <laughs> and she'd love to make an arcana check with her goggles of object reading to see if, if she can learn okay. more about this platform. All right, go ahead and give me an arcana check. It's a 17. 
So you see exactly what I had described to Ada. Uh, but it, in addition to that, you can see clearly that there is a open frame of crystalline structure of some kind. Um, uh, like um, square cube-like form at the very center of this platform. And that's where the light is coming from. You also see faint shifting movement in the light as a result of this, like as if a something is inside of that cube. It doesn't escape the bounds of the cube in the moments of observation that you give. Um, and you also see no threat to any of you. What size is the cube? It's uh, about 15 feet on each side. Okay. Um, the platform itself is like a good 30 feet round or 30 feet radius rather. So it looks, I can see a cube in the, in the middle of that light. And it looks like, it looks like there's something in it. Oh, interesting. Well, uh, Reeves, you want to go grab that? So Reeves <laughs> jumps across the space very easily. It's only a, a couple of feet um, and leaps onto the platform. It feels like strong earth beneath his feet as he steps on it. Uh, there is no effect, uh, no change, nothing occurs other than he is now standing on the other platform. I jump tentatively. Just like leap straight up in the air? Yeah, to see if the, the, the entire platform, platform was... just falls apart. You are now falling. No, I'm kidding. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, you, you take a little hop and there is no effect. I'll walk towards the center of the platform with the lights the brightest. Okay. It, come in. The water's fine, I guess. Are the rest of you following, Reese? It really seems like maybe more of a one-man job if you're just getting it and then bringing it back, you know? I mean, it's big. It's 15 feet. It's not like a cube that he can grab. S strong man. Very strong yeah. man. Reeves is. I've always said that. Um, Ada's curiosity gets the better of her, and she's going to jump over, too. Okay. Val. And na narrowly avoid throwing up in the process. <laughs> oh, Val looks at Walsh. Now this is the time he cut and run. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. She'll jump across as well. All right. Does Walsh stay on the platform? Well, you, you, you need a getaway driver in case you got to beat a, a hasty retreat. So I'll just stay here at the helm in case you okay. need me. All right. Uh, there's a moment where Falstaff kind of looks up at you and then looks across and there's this almost like, you can't really make faces, but you get like the sense that he's kind of whimpering, like, come on, man, this, what, what are we, what are we, what are we, uh, oh. <laughs> Falstaff so, has FOMO. <laughs> yeah. Big FOMO. Um, there you, there you stand, Walsh, as everyone else disappears, their forms disappear into the brightness of this light. As you all step in, uh, in your various places, as soon as you are within the eminence of the light, there's a brief, like, flash of where you just can't see, and then once you're inside of it, you begin to see things extremely clearly. There is, uh, a large, very plainly glass steel cube, um, but this is probably more clear than um, than any that uh, either Ada or Val uh, has ever seen, right? And I think at least Ada has seen the manufacturing of glass steel up close. So she knows what goes into this, and this is the most perfect that she has ever seen. Walking right. in a seemingly random pattern within this cube all of you see before you a form of almost pure arcane energy ada immediately recognizes that this is not a living creature of any kind uh, or if it is it is one not from this plane of existence as this being just casually strolls throughout the space you can discern features that are vaguely humanoid uh, in shape, and the arcane energy that is wafting off of it um, is definitely imposing to any of you. And as soon as your vision clears and you see it, 
it casually just turns back towards you. And as it begins to speak in ancient Arbrathian, Ada kind of recognizing the tongue and trying to discern the words that are being said, the rest of you having no idea what is being said, all of you, except for Walsh, obviously, who is not privy to any of this, um, all of you feel in your mind a spell taking hold, and slowly the words start to become clear, as if you can understand everything that this being is saying. And as it stares out, its eyes made of pure arcane energy looking at back and forth between all three of you, you catch the final ending of whatever the lengthy statement that it was saying, as it finishes by stating, and what is the business today? I just, Ada looks <laughs> to her companions. Uh, was there anything that I would have heard prior to this is that? Okay. entirely uh, Super, the, okay. you, you were very caught up in the confusion of it and trying to translate yeah. in your mind the ancient yeah. Obrathian because this like this is so far ancient okay that she had no comprehension something along the lines of welcome and maybe like glad that you are well okay and it <clears throat> it stands there just observing all of you waiting for a response I, I have, what are we here for? Um, uh, okay. Um, and <laughs> Ada will put on her, uh, best like business face. Um, look at this ethereal creature from, you know, the dawn of time, uh, and just sort of explain, <laughs> their their general uh goal here what they're looking for and uh they're just uh just looking she won't say anything about like needing to take anything but just um that they're in so search. the general sense you're seeking knowledge and crystals yes. and yeah anything of mm -hmm. the like um as as ada is kind of recounting all of this the being keeps looking back and forth between the three of you paying special mind to vow seemingly like going back to Deval several times, um, seemingly listening intently to what Ada is saying. And as she finishes her description, the, the being stops and looks back at Ada uh, and says, of what subject are you looking to inquire from the memory? Uh, the memory? Yes. Are you the memory? Yes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> once again, she'll look over to Val and to, to Reeves. Do you have a catalog? As soon as you say that, its hand just kind of drifts in the air, uh, and you can see arcane sigils just falling off of its fingers. Um, as if a spell was being cast just by the, the general motion of its hand. Uh, and appearing in Val's hand before her is a sphere of pure glass steel that has the same kind of fragment of arcane energy just floating within it. Um, and I need for Val, I need Val to make an intelligence saving throw, please. Twenty-one. You are able to withstand the information dump that occurs from just holding on to this catalog of subjects. And it's basically every subject of study that Val has ever seen in any book at the universities um, of the Spires. And some that she doesn't recognize. I know Kung Fu. <laughs> um, 
Val, is that... Is that what we need? I thought, I thought you knew what we needed. I just mean, is, is, that, is that what you need to ask the right questions? This is everything. And I'll, I'll kind of roll the ball over to Aida. <laughs> uh, as, as you begin to roll the ball, um, I need for Ada when she takes it to also make an intelligence saving throw. And I will <laughs> say that because Val is did so well on that save and because of who she is and kind of her history, there is one, and her perception, there is one bit that just kind of floats into her vision as she's handing uh, the crystal over. The fall of Aubrath. And then she releases the crystal. What did Beth, what did, what did you get on the intelligence save? 14. Ada is very much overwhelmed by the information dump that occurs into her mind of just words, of just subjects of study. Um, she can't comprehend even where to begin with this. Val? How does Ada look? She's stunned, basically. I'll walk up to Ada, kind of like support them a little bit, take the crystal out of their hand and put it in their backpack. Are you okay? Uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a lot, eh? It's too much, frankly. Um... But I, I'm good. I'm good. Ada is also this... astute enough to recognize that Val does not seem to be suffering any ill effect from mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Um. Did I get a sense of this being's um like name or like a history of what it might be? Or... I mean, it already introduced itself as the memory. Okay, fair enough. Um, I think with the, what Val has perceived as far, thus far, she would recognize it as a repository of knowledge. You don't know how far back it goes, how current it is, or anything of the sort, but it is, the very least, the most impressive thing that she has ever borne witness to. And I think it sticks in her mind, the notion that there is a recording of some amount of information about the fall of the country in which she was born that still exists today. Um, have you ever heard of something called the fall of Albreth, Ida? Uh, I, yeah, um, maybe. Uh, she's, she like, she is not able to help right now. <laughs> she's out. I would, I would say that she probably has never heard of it in those that term before. Yeah. Okay. I. I. I look to the memory and be like, "What? What is the fall of all breath?" As soon as you say that, the memory turns and regards you for a moment, uh, and. Instead of off of his hands, you see those same kind of runes just materialize in front of it, um, forming out of the energy core that appears to be at its in its chest. And as it does, four different crystals begin to float in the space in front of it. And all three of you bear witness to illusory images of Aubrath. In its form, you can recognize the general territory from looking at maps and things. You know just from that and somehow intrinsically that you're looking at Aubrath, but it's green and forested and has mountains and animals that none of you have ever seen before in the desert of any kind. Um, it looks 
like the most perfect oasis, but on a scale of the entire country. And standing up in this almost bird's eye flight as it as your vision flies through this perfect our breath you see standing higher than even the current spires you see towers made of pure glass steel rippling with arcane energy not that not ones that need construction to hold them up but that are being held up by arcane power in and of themselves a, perhaps to some of you, an almost perfect idealized version of Aubrath. And as you're bearing witness to this, you see one after another, these spires beginning to unleash arcane energy out from them. And all of the green, all of the creatures, all of the people that you see getting to go lifeless as this arcane energy turns in towards the towers, almost as if it's being pulled from the very life essence of all breath itself to empower these arcane towers. And that's when the quakes start to happen. That's when the very land itself begins to uproot and immense fissures in the land open up and the towers begin to fall within the fissures. The arcane energy that is siphoning all of the life essence out of the land itself continues unabated. And you watch in horror over several minutes as it seems like an undeterminable amount of time passes across all breath, turning it into a desert a lifeless space. However, you see a rippling as if there's creatures underneath the sand, immense in size, larger than any of the towers. And every now and then you catch a glimpse of huge, scaled, almost drake-like, as if, as if it was a sand drake, but a mile and a half across, emerging from the sand and then disappearing back beneath. And I need for the three of you to make intelligence saving throws, please. Mm. Ten. Fail. Fourteen. Fail. Fail. Twenty. Succeed. Um, so Ada and Reeves both fail uh, as they are horrified by what they see. Um, and they don't quite wrap their head around what it is that Val is able to, in that Val sees that it's not just the sand drakes that are alive, but the desert itself appears to be alive, as if the desert is one elemental being of some kind. And then as the four crystals that have been floating and giving you this illusory version of this history of Aubrath from ancients past float out away from you or away from the memory, they just hover in the air in front of you. Ada and Reeves are a little bit disoriented from this and they don't have quite the wherewithal to do anything at the moment, giving Valriel an opportunity. I will take them. Do you all take three. all four? Or all four, yeah. Okay. As you all stand there observing the memory, um, Ada and Reeves kind of gather their wits about them, um, and it seems to be waiting for another request. Oh, wow. That was a lot. Um, how long uh, have you been here and how long has it been since the um, the fall of Abrath? It seems to regard you for several long moments as if contemplating. 
According to your current calendar, that would be 8,492 of your years. Is, is the sand alive? Yes. Ada doesn't even know what to ask it. Uh, just <laughs> there, every every question that she's ever had about anything is like racing through her mind, and she's like rolodexing her way to what she actually wants to know in this insane moment. And she, but okay. she's like struggling. What well, caused she, the fall? Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. Go, ahead, go go no go ahead. I was just wondering what what or who caused the fall of Albreth. Albreth caused the fall of our breath. Mm. Those that ruled did not know for what they ruled, and all of our breath suffered in the wake of it and their ignorance. How, how could they have done better by choosing to live with our breath rather than conquering our breath okay um is our breath safe perspective is required for such questions. Save from destruction? From the sands? All breath is the sands. It, is there a way to restore all breath to what it was like before the fall? That is beyond the knowledge of the memory. Okay. Walsh, can you make me a perception check, please? <laughs> I sure can. Um... Twelve. Okay. Um... Do you, you still have uh, another advantage, by the way? I do. I could spend it. I will spend it. <laughs> Intent. 20. That's significantly better. Um, so, Walsh, you're out there for a good long bit. Uh, you're starting to maybe get a little bit worried, but you occupy yourself with the things that your mind does when it wanders and you start looking around at this amazing piece of magical artifice that you've been flying. And as you are kind of drifting to the edges and trying to examine like what sort of magical runes would have to be inscribed where in order to create such a thing, you've been in this space long enough now that your vision has started to acclimate extremely well. And you can, in looking over the edge, you see below you there are dozens, if not hundreds, of these platforms shattered upon the ground, not 150 feet below you. With each one, another cube of glass steel shattered amongst the debris and detrius floating beneath you, a veritable graveyard of magic underneath. And as you are looking down upon it, you see, in fact, another Sandrake below. This one, perhaps a mile, a mile and a half across, just rippling its way 
through the graveyard beneath. And that's where we're going to call it for tonight. Jesus. Oh, no. Okay. Wow. Okay. Uh, Goodness. Thank you what? for joining us, everyone. <laughs> Um, I am, uh, thank you so much for all of the, the subs, uh, and the bits and the raids. That was amazing. Um, I hope you all enjoyed, uh, the story tonight, uh, as much as, uh, I enjoyed watching, uh, all of these fine, fine players that I have before me, uh, venturing their way through these lost ruins. Um, we're gonna, uh, go around the table real quick and let these folks introduce themselves once again, tell us where you can all be found and whatnot but please stick around afterwards uh i'm gonna uh talk a little bit more about uh guild superior and uh then we're gonna uh kick off a raid uh andrew who are you you're a human i think uh yeah. why don't you tell us uh, about yourself yeah i'm andrew a uh, human person i play a val half elf archangel you can find my socials in chat um it's been a lot of fun wasn't expecting to find uh that inside of rune and excited to see where it goes next indeed indeed i am very excited as well uh thank you so much once again for playing uh it, it is it's been phenomenal to get to play with you again sir i'm loving every minute of it uh beth well hi uh i'm beth i can be found on the interwebs at beth masco um and here often on the guild superior channel um and yeah, I I have a lot of things to contemplate over the next week, so uh, I'll be busying myself with that. <laughs> <laughs> Contemplating Ada's whole existence, maybe? Yeah, just a little bit. All right. All right. As long as it's not too much trouble for you. Uh, no, Kay, Who are you? Hi. Where can we find you? What do you do? Uh, my name is Kay, or you can... Look, find me at Caden Cosmos on most of the social platforms at this point. Um, I do art from like things like cross stitch to like graphic design to all sorts of things. I play games. I run trivia at Sly Fox Trivia on Saturdays. Uh, we also run a bunch of other stuff. Um, and I played Reeves today. Uh, it's a bit of a hard ass looking to um, uh, uh, immigrate. Uh, immigrate. <laughs> He just wants to be a normal guy. Yeah, he just wants to live a life. Anyway. He wants yeah. to go fishing. <laughs> yeah. Chill out. Will. Will, Hello, tell us about hi, yourself, my, please. My name is Will. Um, you can find me on the social media at a Will M. Scream. I was Walsh Payne tonight, the artillerist, artificer, scoundrel type guy. Uh, I was also Falstaff, technically, the monkey slash cannon. And uh, I can most often be found over at Life from the Apocalypse, which is a not-for-profit TTRPG studio that makes actual play content in the form of podcasts and streams to raise money for nonprofits and good organizations. Um, we're currently fundraising for the First Nations Development Institute, and we will be, um, if you want to see more of me tomorrow night, we'll be streaming our Eldritch Horror Pokemon TTRPG Missing Numbers over at twitch.tv slash live from the apocalypse, where I play Julian Rue, ex-Team Rocket member turned chef. It's kind of a light week for us. I think that's the only uh, stream we have this week. Uh, but I was fortunate enough to be interviewed on the Reckless Attack podcast. Uh, so if you know Reckless Attack, I sat down with Nathan, and that is going to be dropping on Thursday. If you want to check it out, uh, Reckless Attack on all the podcast platforms. Awesome. Awesome. I will definitely be tuning in for that. That's great to hear. Uh, I have been uh, Miko. Uh, I am at the underscore OKS underscore GM on all of the socials. Uh, I do lots of things, GMing, producing, all of that fine stuff. Uh, links and stuff are in the chat. Uh, feel free to, to hit me up if you ever want to talk uh, homebrew and, and the like. Uh, and this has been a ton of fun, guys. I was really glad uh, to, to get to this point. Uh, I hope it didn't rock your world too much uh, with that lore dump, but I really enjoyed it. I hope you did too. Uh, and please, everyone, tune in next week for part four of the Lost Sands. Uh, bye everyone.